Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corbid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. I forgot to well. turn on the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Except there are <laughs> <laughs> waiting to go on. My bad. We have, we have delayed Beaver. <laughs> well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number three hundred and eighty-seven of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on. Crying Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day, is Wednesday, May 22nd, 2024. And it is a gorgeous morning here at the Beaver Lodge. It's been really interesting, actually, the last three mornings. Three mornings ago, it was a beautiful spring cool and fog. Mm-hmm. I woke up. And then yesterday, we had cloud bursts of rain. And now today, just the sun's like popping up. Uh, you can see it on my face uh, above the roof uh, next door mm-hmm. in front. And it's like saying, good morning, everyone. It, it poured here yesterday. It's overcast and foggy in Ottawa right now. Oh, completely different here. Yeah, it's like it's, today it's, it's like, oh my God, I'm going to put on my gardening gloves. And <laughs> well, so, that give you an idea. Well, my, that, that, that was Monday morning here. <clears throat> In, in my back, in, a, in our backyard. Yeah. I guess it was. And then in the back, it's like at the end of the backyard, the neighbors in the back have a whole bunch of lilac bushes on the back fence. So, and, and the, our yard is long. So I come out and there's just like this long distance and there's all this green with these little pops of like, you know, that beautiful light lilac purple and then mm-hmm. this gray fog all around it and then everything else is green right and then we got the stack the, the stack of firewood the you know to chop so it's like there's like firewood it's like, it's just like just totally nature right mm-hmm. just like ah so lovely <laughs> so yeah but yeah three 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 different mornings completely yes kit saucy Mr. Grizzly is indeed looking fancy today. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey, and of course, Mr. Grizzly is here with me. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, the Pepper Master, the Misfy Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today, and why do you, well, I mean, I shouldn't say why do you look so damn fine, because you pretty much always do, but why do we look so chic? Uh, board meeting today and tomorrow. Um, this will be my last one, of course. They because you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, no, I, I I suit up for the board meetings just to show respect to the board members, and uh, they're all. I like all of them. I like all of them. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, mm-hmm. board meeting. Mental health wise, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about that yesterday, and I'm not doing good actually. Um, I'm not. I was wondering. Yeah, I'm not doing good. Um, 
yesterday was a really bad mental health day. Uh, Monday, I was I, I was too tired to do an ASMR, and I, I could it slipped my mind. You know, holiday Monday, so I was thinking it was Sunday. And like, anyway, and uh, yeah, yesterday was um, feeling useless, uh, self loathing, uh, just the general despair that one feels when one feels like their their purpose is is being eradicated which you know i mean truth be told that's kind of what's happening to me uh so it's 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 a tough pill to swallow uh i've you know i've been told that basically uh, it's budget cuts is what it is you know so they're going to offload my duties to uh, three other people who um i will uh told them i said here's my number call me if you get really stuck on anything because i know there's equipment that needs to be upgraded and updated and it won't happen for another number of months. So I'm literally the stuff that's being held together with uh, crazy glue and duct tape, not literally, but figuratively, um, I've done what I had to do to keep the system operational and created, got cr very creative. And, and, uh, I'm, I'm afeared that, um, the next board meeting comes September that everything's going to crash on them. And I, I don't want that to happen. Uh, but, you know, anyway, um, yeah. so yeah, I'm just feeling, yeah, worthless right now and I don't want to, oh. you know, but that's what I'm feeling and I'm, I'm doing better today than I was yesterday. That's the truth. Yesterday it was really dark, um, really, really dark yesterday, feeling just absolute horrible. And I come home and, and of course got this 85 pound jumping happy dog, uh, going crazy for me which does lift the spirits so i took her out for a walk of course it was pouring rain the whole time so we weren't out for very long and then came back home fed her supper and then just cuddled on the couch for a while till i fell asleep <laughs> um and you know uh, lack of sleep also contributes to it and i, I was not i haven't been sleeping that well lately and that is one of the side effects of the medication it does disrupt your sleep patterns but you know just just feeling uh, this way right now and i know I know it's not me. I know it's money. I know it's budgetary. I know it's, it's nothing personal. I do know all of that. What? When you suddenly don't know what your purpose is, it's, it's a gut punch. You know, yeah. I, I read an article about a, a, um, this man who talked about his father, who his father had planned to retire at 50 and he saved and he scrimped and invested in, and he was very wealthy by the time he retired at 50. And he was dead at 53 by his own hand because he had no more purpose in this world. I'm not saying that's where I am, but I'm saying that's, you know, that's, that's how, when you don't have a reason anymore, it, it can be really tough. And that's kind of what I'm going through. Now I know I have lots of people that love me and depend upon me. I have my dog, my, my wife, my family, you know, and, and there's this project that we have been pursuing for the last four years. So I don't, I don't, I know I have a place in this world and, I, and that I'm needed and I'm that I'm wanted and that I have a purpose. I know all of that. I'm aware of all of that. Yes. It's quite. Yeah. But I'm still feeling what I'm feeling. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's an emotion that I'll go through. Um, it's just tough knowing that there's the end of the line. You know, it's, it's right there. It's, you know, and, and all things come to an end. Um, that's realistic to think otherwise would be foolish. And I just thought I had more time there. That's all. So, you know, okay. it's tough. Well, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it, consider how much you like it there. Mm -hmm. And endings are tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, good endings matter. Oh, yes. Right? But endings are tough. I mean, you're not going through anything any average person wouldn't be going through considering the circumstances. Mm -hmm. I think I mean, you're right about that. that. That's, yeah. that's number one. There's, there's something that's just normally situational about what you're, you're, you're going through at the moment, but oh my word. Um, yeah. Uh, you, the, the whole, uh, what's your purpose thing. I'm, I'm very familiar with it. I mean, I was a dance student from the time I was eight till I was 21. I was doing a bachelor of fine arts and dance at Concordia university. And then I just bust up my knee and, uh, that's it. You know, I'm it's talking done. to the sports medicine doctor and it's like, well, I mean, unless you want to get intimately familiar with the wheelchair, I would stop. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, had my, my knee reconstructed, had to learn to walk all over again from scratch at 25, but you're sitting there like this, you know, when you're in the arts, some it's people say have a backup plan mm -hmm. because you need one. And then there's a whole school that says, don't have a backup plan because yes. when times get tough and they will, you'll fall on the backup and then you'll never realize your dream. I had no backup plan. Mm -hmm. it's so all I am, all of a sudden I wake up at, th at 21 after 20. 13 years of having done something. And, um, and I reached as high as I could. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was doing a bachelor of finance. I was good enough to be admitted in the program, uh, you know, and the next day it was gone. gone. Yeah. Nothing. It's done. Well, and you know, I could take solace it's, in the fact hard. that, that, uh, I do have people who are saying, I don't, I don't understand why this is taking place. And there's, there's a number of people that have, that, that have expressed to me that they're very upset by this. And I'm like, well, thank you. That's very kind. This doesn't, I'm not going to pay my rent. <laughs> I don't yeah. say that. I don't say that. Yes. And here's the thing. True. I'm not going to be unemployed because right. I'm employed by a company that contracts me to the location of where I'm working. Mm -hmm. That contract is not being renewed. So I, I still have a job. Yeah. What I'll be doing on June 17th, I don't know. Well, that's and the other thing. That's the anxiety inducing part. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. And I, I've already talked to my boss about how I cannot go back out into the field. I can't do... And he goes, oh, Paul, that's a waste of your skill set. I'm like, okay, thank you for recognizing that. I said, I can't do that anymore, though. He goes, no, 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 I would not do that to you. He goes, I recognize what your skill set is, and we need to put it to better use. I'm like, thank you. That's good to know. But I don't know if there's a position like that. Mm -hmm. So what happens on June 17th? I don't know. Well, do I go on vacation on July 5th like I had planned, three weeks off to go to Calgary for two weeks? Right now, I have no idea. I have no idea. My vacation was approved, but then the rug was pulled out from under me. Do I do I cancel my vacation? If I start a new uh, position somewhere, are they going to be excited about me taking three weeks off, three weeks after I started? Probably not, but to be honest with you, I really don't give a shit. I'm entitled to my vacation. I've bloody well earned it. I've had no time off since last July. I've canceled two years in a row. That was just I can't make that. it a third. My mental health can't handle that. And I know these are our first world white privilege male problems. I recognize that. But they're real for you. But they're real for me. And you know what the thing is? They all add up. It's, it's not one cut. It's 10,000, right? Well, yes. Well, there's all of that. Like I said, there's the layering, the fact that you haven't had a vacation for a while. There's a couple of times that you've like had plans. Like you had a plan to go to Switzerland and then you had a Canceled. plan to go out sick. east. And then, so, I mean, you know, the, the three disappointments in terms of that you do need some time off and then you add to that unknown mm -hmm. right you don't know what's going to happen and then whatever it is that's going to happen wherever ever it is you're going to go it's another damn day one and yeah. day ones suck well and and they don't get any easier and, and day twos are worse I'm, I'm gonna be 50, <laughs> i'll be 56 in july and having to start over again somewhere else just really does not appeal to me. It's like a new culture, new people room to know, new environments, new to navigate, and then whatever. I mean, it's, ugh, and then having to prove yourself, like even though you're coming in as the expert, you know, there's always somebody. They don't that's, know. Well, me. they don't. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the same, like, it's really silly, but, you know, we'll, like really silly things, like if people say, you know, like like migrate off Twitter, you know, Elon mm -hmm. Musk bought it, like this go somewhere else. Yeah, but okay, I just spent three years building, building yeah. following there. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy. It's, it's not like I'm saying, hey, I'm moving to Blue Sky and that everybody follows. It, gonna... it doesn't happen that way like, at all. So you know, it's like, why are you leaving? It's like because I invested. Count all the hours. Count yeah. like I, in building that. That's yeah, I know. There is a monetary value to that. Yeah. Right. Time so, yeah, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I know. I know what you're saying. So it's just, it's just a situation for me that I can't control and all yeah. I control, all I can control and is how I react to it. Right. Um, and right now my emotions are getting the better of me because my brain chemistry is not where it should be. Now the medication is helping, but it's sometimes it's not enough. And when you get hit, you know, a gut punch like this, it, it just really knocks you on your what? And like I said, it's, it's all, it's the unknown. It's the new place. It's all of these things. And that is the, the part that's really tough. Well, my friend, 
I might have a little something related that will brighten your mood in your day. Oh, what's that, sir? Um, Ozzy Pete sent us a few things. Oh, did he? To look at. And uh, here's one. Just a second. Show the kids. Oh, not wrong one. Ooh, I like that. That's really good. Or you're going to feel like you're at the eye doctor. One or two. Oh, oh yes, exactly. Ah. I saw the first one and I thought I love that, and then I saw I this, like one, this one too. I like the colors. And um, I, I, I do like both. the colors of this, but you know what? I love the font of the other the font one. too. Right? Nothing says <sighs> we can't use both. I know. So let's get the kits and cubs to vote on it. Which one do you want? Number two or number one? Number one. See, I like that because it's got the brain. It's got the mental health one. Yeah. I love the font. Number one or number two? All right. Kittle that goes, goes, ooh, can he mix the two? Mm, I'm not sure. Graphically, yeah, I'm not sure know. if it works. Yeah, I don't Color know. Color-wise, it maybe you could. Yeah. Number one, number one, number one, three number ones, one number two. But if the color and mental health walk on this one were like the other one? Maybe, maybe. maybe. But the, I like the, crisp, the simplicity the crisp, of this, Yeah, though. exactly. That's why I mean the crisp black and white is, is... Yeah, it's just simple, a flat design. Yeah. Number mm. one with the rainbow colors. So, all right. Well, hey, like I said, the wonderful... Two, <laughs> two looks, looks like, like it's for a rave cruise. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, man. Ah, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. All right. Uh, so, yes, keep voting, kids and cubs. But, yes, uh, we're going to have to pick something because we have uh, to <laughs> we have some communicating to do. But, yeah, June 15th, kids and cubs. Uh, and please, uh, if you have the opportunity. Um, Ooh, there's, a, there's an interesting thought. What? Make the brain, brain rainbow? rainbow. Hmm. That's an interesting thought. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. That might yeah. be able to work. Number uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Ms. Shattuck. Number one looks, it, it does look more, you know, official, I think. A L- little less whimsy with number one. Yes. And though we can I, be whimsical. I, but I, think, I don't mind whimsy. <laughs> no, no. It's kind of, with my, kind of my brand. <laughs> with, with the topic uh, and, 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 the, and the choice, that's, that's, I think number one, I think, for me, no, number one. Okay, that, there's my vote cast, number one. Uh, if we could put the brain bow, I like that, James, the brain bow. Make it a uh. brain bow. Talk to Pete about it. I know okay. I Pete was messaging us last night, but I was already asleep. <laughs> so, so the in w- suggesting that the brain be full and rainbow and rainbowed, or, or maybe just some color in it. I don't know. But anyway. hmm. Okay. All right. I'll see what see what we can do. Ah, rainbow. <laughs> okay. So here's what's going to take place now. I have to get into the office. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to venture out. Uh, you will uh, obviously be be here. Uh, I won't end the stream, of course. And my phone is about to die because I forgot to charge it. So I will just uh, pick up when I get to the office, which should be in about 15, 20 minutes. And I have to take care of something when I get, I might be 30 minutes. If I can be quicker, I will. But it's just what I'm dealing with, you know. You know how it is. Yep. All right. So I will uh, see you soon. All right. See you soon. Oh, wait, I got to turn my camera off here. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah, a bit of a different start this morning to the show. A uh, little, little extra banter, but uh, it's important. It's important. It's important to make time for friends. I mean, that's the whole point, right? You know, this was inspired by something called Spoke to a Bloke. So, hey, two blokes just spoke. And uh, so I'm, uh, it's, it, it's tough when you have to, uh, you know, make a big change, particularly, you know, when you talk about work, because, you know, if we're talking about spending eight hours a day at work, and well, a lot of us do overtime, um, you you got to like where you work, and you got to like the people you work for and the people you work with, uh, because, you know, life can be, uh, life is short, but life can be long. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, so, 
you when, when you find a place where you fit in and you're very very happy and you feel respected and you feel validated and you enjoy going there um you know um, and then you have to change it's a uh, just transitions suck they're tough they're, they're just always tough so um yeah um, I, f- I feel for Mr. Grizzly. We had talked about this before, and uh, uh, I didn't mention it proactively, one, because it's not my news to tell. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, I was aware that Mr. Grizzly had been going through uh, some stuff, and uh, he was uh, uh, doing a very, very good job at uh, maintaining um, a professional face, let's just say, uh, on the show. Um but uh, yeah, the, the the last few weeks uh, have not been easy. So um, uh, personally, I'm glad uh, he spoke about it. But it was uh, up to him uh, to do that. So uh, um, uh, when he was ready, and I guess today he was. So, um, but uh, I know that uh, the kids and the cubs here uh, are all sending their absolute best and uh, all their good vibes and their, uh, you know rooting for him because, well, you know, that's the kind of culture we try to build here. So if like attracts like, then uh, I know you're sending out good vibes. So uh, from here, thank you so much, everyone. All right. On with the show. This is it. (laughs) The big, uh, there's, well, there's lots of big news, but uh, one of the big pieces of news here. Uh, is the inflation data, uh, kids and cubs, because uh, it came in yesterday. It actually came in during the show. Often I look for it during the show, and sometimes it doesn't, but it actually did come out early yesterday, uh, I guess because people were very, very, very much waiting for it. Uh, and uh, But when, I, uh, when we logged off, uh, I saw the top line number at first, and it said that uh, the consumer price index top line number had dropped down to 2.7%. Now, we'll remember that last month, uh, and this is for April 2024, so for March it was uh, 29 and then for February it was 28 so it was bouncing up and down around there. But it's now at 27 which is the lowest it has been since uh, this whole curb up and back down uh, started so that is very, very positive news uh, because yesterday we were talking, uh, not yesterday, I think, or maybe the day before we were talking, we were saying that uh, the experts were thinking of about maybe 2.8. So this is slightly better than what was forecast. So that's very good information. Uh, some, uh, according to Statistics Canada here, it says, uh, Broad-based deceleration in the headline consumer price index was led by food prices, services, and durable goods. The deceleration in the consumer price index was moderated by gasoline prices, which rose at a faster pace in April, up 6.1%, than in March, up 4.5%. But excluding gasoline, all items uh, consumer price index slowed to 2.5 year-over-year increase down from a 2.8 gain in March. So, pardon me, I'm just going to have a sip of water here. So we have the two measures, right? We have the consumer price index, and then we have the consumer price index, uh, including um, some of the more volatile components. And that one last month, uh, while the core index went up to 2.9, that one had gone down to 2.8, and that one keeps on going down to 2.5. So in pretty much in other words, if it weren't for the fact that gas and a couple of other things, I'm sure, uh, went up a little bit. Uh, we might be reporting 2.5 now instead of 2.7. So, um, which is, I mean, if we're talking about going midway, mid range between the, the Bank of Canada's target of 2 and 3%, 2.5 is right smack in the middle. Uh, on a monthly basis, the consumer price index rose 0.5% in April. Half a percent, mainly driven by prices for gasoline. On a seasonally adjusted monthly basis, the CPI rose 0.2% in April. Now, here's the best part. While food 
Prices for food purchased from stores continued to increase. The index grew at a slower pace year over year in April, 1.4% compared with March 1.9. Meat contributed the most to slower price growth, largely due to a base year effect in prices for fresh or frozen beef as a result of a monthly increase in April 2023, which fell out of the 12th month movement. Other contributors to the slowdown in grocery prices included other food products and non-alcoholic beverages, up 2.1%. Bakery and cereal products up 0.2%. Fruit, fruit preparations, and nuts actually decelerated by 0.8%. Fish, seafood, and other marine products decelerated by 1.8%. From April 2021 to April 2024, food prices for food purchased from stores increased 21.4%. So over three years, the price of food went up 21.4%. Yikes. Price growth for food purchased from restaurants also eased on a yearly basis, rising 4.3 in April following a 5.1 increase in March. The index was unchanged month over month in April. Uh, In terms of gasoline, consumers paid 6.1% more at the pump every year over year in April following a 4.5% increase in March, which was what we said earlier in the opening. Faster growth was driven by a 7.9% month over month increase in April. Higher costs associated with switching to summer blends, higher oil prices due to supply concerns, and an increase in the federal carbon levy all contributed to the increase in prices. All three of those things combined. All right. And I am going to guess that the federal carbon levy was the smallest of the three. Just saying. Um, for Alberta, there's some interesting data, specifically the consumer price index in Alberta decelerated year over year in April, partly due to prices for electricity and natural gas. Partially offsetting this were higher prices for rent, which rose 16.2% year over year in April, up from a 14.2% increase in March. Rent in Alberta increased at a higher rate than it did at the national level, 8.2% in April, for the eighth consecutive month, which coincides with strong demand from high net interprovincial migration to Alberta. So we actually have an interesting situation because while conservatives have been complaining about our immigration levels within the country, uh, from outside the country to within the country, when they're talking about housing, uh, Alberta is having a problem with housing because of migration within the country, people from Canada moving to Alberta. So they launched this big campaign to get everybody to come there. But they didn't have places for them to stay. So the government in Alberta is literally doing the same thing that the federal government needed. They had a worker shortage. They're competing against other provinces to draw people because they had low they were bragging about their uh, lower um, cost of housing so everybody went there a whole bunch of people went there and now all of a sudden they are the province of canada that has the highest inflation in rent for lodging so Yeah, that's the thing about these types of policies. It's like this, you get the extra workers because you need them to keep the economy running. However, it puts a strain on the system. It increases demand, which, if there's not enough supply, raises prices, and then you have a different type of problem. So sometimes the solution to fix one problem comes with its own set of unique problems that then need to be fixed. And that's pretty much what's going on here in in Alberta with regard to this. I see the the kids here going, Kit Cassie, Premier Canu kept his election promise on a gas tax holiday for us in Manitoba. He's extended it through September. Uh, There we go. So that's that's helping a little bit over there. And uh, that's uh, something more provincial premiers should do. Again, I keep on saying it on the show, right? If the provincial premiers are so considered about the cost of living, turning to the federal government and saying, Justin, do something when they too run a government with a budget is not good enough. So Mr. Canoe put his money where his mouth is uh, on that. Um, we got Pierre Poliev asking uh, the federal government to remove the gas tax for the summer. He didn't make the same request of provincial premiers, though. So, uh, how much he really believes in it? Well, put it this way: how much 
Is he calling for that because he wants it for you? Or is he calling for that because, well, he knows the federal government is just not going to do it. So he can call for it. But you'd think if he really cared about making the cost of living better for Canadians, that he would be applying pressure on all governments that could reduce gas taxes for you and not just one. So maybe his position on this is not actually about making life better less affordable for you, but just creating, uh, asking your opponent to do something you know they're not going to do and then turn around and saying, see how much he hates you? You got to under. Uh, now, according to Statistics Canada, uh, prices for, in terms of food, here it says, uh, Meat, other food and non-alcoholic beverages, bakery green cereal products, vegetables and vegetable preparations, dairy products and eggs, uh, all went are all still uh, in um, positive in positive in, in terms of uh, positive inflationary for the last twelve months. Uh, but f fruit, fruit preparations and nuts and fish, seafood and other marine products uh, are actually uh, going through uh, deflation as well. So it's good that uh, food prices, uh, because everybody has to eat, <laughs> right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's going to help people uh, a lot. However, uh, because um, lodging is contributing so much to inflation uh, at the moment, it seems to be the main contributor uh, because of the rise, uh, one rise in interest rates for mortgages and then, of course, Rise, rises in rents also due to that type of stuff and uh, lots of provincial premiers removing rent controls. So um, that's a big contributor, a bigger contributor. So um, speculation with regard to a rate cut, which is why everybody was really waiting for this number, uh, was to, uh, has switched a little bit as soon as these numbers came out. Um, I think we mentioned yesterday on the show that... Um, prognosticators, economic prognosticators were saying that there would be about a 40% chance of a rate cut on June 5th announced by the Bank of Canada and then a greater chance of it in July. Uh, but now that has gone to about 60% as soon as the numbers came up. So it's looking more likely, like I suggested yesterday, that there might be a rate cut uh, on June 5th because the, the inflation numbers uh, beat slightly beat expectations, but still uh, beat expectations. So there you go. Uh, we'll be waiting for that. This caused, um, and now I kind of wish that uh, um, Mr. Grizzly were here, but he, he can't show it uh, when that happens. But it caused yesterday um, Michelle Ferrari to post a tweet. Uh, now, how I put this? They seem to do this either the day before or the day of an announcement coming. Uh, a conservative will post something that says the complete opposite of the news that is about to come. So uh, Michelle Ferreri, uh, 18 hours ago, posted something from the National Post. It was Frank Son, a stronach, who wrote an opinion piece. Uh, basically asking, if no one wants to invest in Canada, what does that say about our country? And it has a picture of uh, people walking outside the TSX in uh, Toronto, and then it has the TX6, the TSX has a, an electronic sign that says what it is at the time, and at the time when the picture was taken, it says that the TSX is at 13,891 and 88, and down 239.5 points. Okay. Um, thing is, is that yesterday at some point, and again, if I could show you the, the pictures, I would, um, the TSX hit an all-time high of around 22,533. 22,000. 
533. The picture showed way less than that. The picture that was shown on that uh, article showed 13,000. I don't remember the last time the TSX was at 13,000 kits and cubs. So I'm actually going to go take a look at that. And the last time, well, was during the, the pre-COVID, if we don't count the pre-COVID crash, right? Or the, the pre-COVID crash, the crash that came in COVID, because yes, the whole stock market went down. But not counting that part, the last time the stock market was at 13, was in 2016. So it's a National Post article with a photo from 2016. If it's not one that was taken during the COVID crash. And I would guess it's not because in the photo, uh, there's a whole bunch of people in the city moving around and doing stuff. So <laughs> I'm going to guess that this was 2016. Yeah. So the conservatives, Michelle Ferrari, it says we have the worst. And then she, she says the article said, the article says, it says we have the worst prime minister ever. The ever in all caps. How many boxes of Tim Biebs do you want to bet that uh, if we go out and read that article, it doesn't say that we have the worst prime minister ever? Michelle Ferry goes, don't worry, you don't even have to read this. It says we have the worst prime minister ever. Uh, <laughs> they try real hard. And then she's not the only one that did that. Uh, we have um, conservative MP... Uh, Jas Jasraj Singh Halan. Now, if that name is familiar to you, uh, if you remember during the conservative leadership, uh, there was a gentleman who appeared to have a whole stack of votes for uh, Pierre Polyev, like a ton of them, and he like put them on the back of his car or something like that to show like what the whole length of them was. He says, yeah, I'm going to bring these ballots for Pierre to be... Uh, the place where they need to be counted, which made everybody wonder, well, how do you know that they're ballots for Pierre since they're all supposed to be in sealed envelopes and they're all supposed to be? And why are you harvesting ballots and then bringing them? Why, aren't, why are people sending their ballots to your constituency office rather than putting them in, in the self, in the stamped envelope, prepaid stamped envelope that comes with the thing and putting it in the mail? So, um, yeah, there were some very, very, very weird things going on. So he was one of the people who took pictures of himself, proudly showing all the ballots that he was personally carrying from one spot to another without any supervision or safety. <laughs> he was a terrible process. Anyway, he quotes a Calgary Herald opinion piece um, by a columnist, Bread. I uh, don't remember his first name. So Don, I think, Brad. Inflation is pure poison and liberals continue to fuel it with spending and the taxes. Inflation is ravaging Alberta consumers with prices that seem far higher than official rate and liberals do nothing about it. Well, yeah, your rent is going up higher than any other place in the country. So, yeah, um, but rent is a provincial thing, sir. I'm not sure what it is you want the liberals to do about that. Uh, so this was May 20th, the day before the inflation numbers came out. Jasraj Singh Halan. After nine years of this liberal NDP government's reckless deficit spending, Canadians were left with 40-year highs in inflation and the most rapid interest rate hikes in Canadian history. And so was the rest of the world because it wasn't after nine years of this liberal NDP government, it was after three years of COVID. 
Three years of COVID, two years of drought, one year of war. <laughs> Jeez. The Bank of Canada knows this, hence the continuing high interest rates. The Liberal government of Canada doesn't know this. They continue the clueless, dangerous rush to raise debt and buy votes with the money, says Brad. And that's the part that uh, Jasraj Singh Halan decided to highlight. Trudeau is not worth the cost. So the day before inflation numbers come out that say that our inflation numbers are the best inflation numbers that we've had since this whole thing started... On the day before, inflation numbers that come out that make the market determine that it's probably more likely that the Bank of Canada is going to give some people some interest rate relief in about two weeks. They put out something saying that inflation is pure poison and liberals are not doing, liberals are fueling it with their spending. It's going down. It's going down. <laughs> the consumer price index, when you strip out all the volatile elements, is at 2.5. It's literally right between the mid-range of the Canada Bank of Canada's target. It's going down. But they're still telling Canadians that the Liberals are fueling inflation with spending. They just lie. They just lie. And then on the day the numbers come out, and here's the other thing, Trevor Toom said, positive piece of today's inflation data, the pace of food price growth over the past three months averaged on an annualized basis is down 1.1%. The last three months average on an annualized basis, food, the price of food has decelerated. According to econo economist Trevor Toome, the data is somewhat at odds with those who make strong claims that the carbon tax was a key reason for the past food price increases. Conservatives say they love listening to economists. Trevor Toome is one of the nation's most noted economists. This data is somewhat at odds with those who make strong claims that the carbon tax was a key reason for past food price increases. So, um, Mr. Uh, Jasraj Singh Halan uh, engaged in a little bit of premature enunciation. His tweet already did not age well. And if the Bank of Canada cuts rates on June 15th, um, Mr. Singhalan will have proven that he shouldn't be an MP because he doesn't need to, he doesn't know how to read a room or the economy. So we literally have the best numbers we've had in a long, long time. And it seems that the conservative uh, opinion on this day is to try to create the impression that nobody wants to invest in Canada and that uh, we are, that inflation is still rising. Yeah. That's the conservative play. Fear and, uh, and lies, just, mis just misinformation. So, um, you can, you, <sighs> it's really, really tiring. Really tiring. Uh, exactly. Kid, Kid Vim, you are right. The Bank of Canada followed economics monetary policy theory to a T in this one. Th that's absolutely correct. And they are the ones that are making the decisions. Right? There are a lot of people, the, the other thing that uh, people are saying, for example, the, another whopper I heard yesterday, is that the uh, Canada has the worst projected growth in the OECD for the next few decades. Um, I'm not sure that the OECD does projections up to like two decades ahead. Um, I think most people do budgetary projections for five years. And even in the five years, they tell us like the five years is so way out. And then I went to go look at the OECD numbers and it says 1% for this year, which is lower than the OECD average and lower than 
world average, of course, uh, but far from a bottom of the pack. And then um, data says that for the data in February was saying that for the first quarter of 2024, and we don't have the numbers for March yet, but in terms of GDP growth, uh, we could ex- we were on pace for uh, 2.5 for the first quarter rather than just one. So we were exceeding it. And then for 2024, it said that we were going to, OECD was predicting 1.8% growth, which was the OECD average. So again, uh, is the projected OECD average, I say, for 2020, uh, for 2024. So, um, again, <laughs> not at the bottom of the, the pile uh, at all. Um, so, yeah, the people just, if you're tr- getting your economic information online, uh, please do make sure that they actually are reputable and trusted uh, economists and al- and analysts because people are just inventing statistics and inventing facts. Because I'm pretty sure that if Canada, the OECD had forecast that Canada would have the lowest GDP growth outlook over the next two decades, It would have been top line news everywhere and Pierre Polyev would be screaming it from the rooftops. If that were actually true, he didn't have to lie about it and he'd actually have something he could point to, he'd be shouting it from the rooftops. So, you know, we are doing really well. And compared to our peer peer nations, we are doing very, very, very well. When they're talking about the lack of economic growth, you have to understand that the Bank of Canada was raising interest rates for the purpose, the express purpose of cooling the economy. <laughs> to try and curb inflation. So it's like it's like they're sitting there and they're complaining that inflation is too high, but the economy isn't growing fast enough. Well, you have to cool economic growth, hopefully without sending it into a recession, hence the term soft landing, which appears to have been accomplished here, which is like the Goldilocks scenario, which a lot of people try to engineer, but often rarely happens because most people over or undershoot. It seems that the Bank of Canada got it right, and as Kit Vim says, the Bank of Canada acts alone at arm's length to the government. Anything about the GDP going on right now when you're having a conversation about that, that's mostly the doing of the governors of the Bank of Canada at the moment. Because they've been acting on interest rates specifically for that purpose. To moderate growth. So it's not that our economy is weak. It's not that we're terrible people. We're worse than everybody else. It's we have been trying to slow the economy. That's why unemployment is now at 6.1% rather than close to 4, where it was at one point. They're trying to slow wage growth. They're trying to, but at the same time, we have competing forces, right? We need bodies. We need people working. That's what the number of people that are coming into the country, because those people need people to provide services. So that creates more jobs. So that's why we have, for example, reporting that we created 90,000 jobs in the previous month, but the employment rate still stayed steady at 6.1% because there was time. If you had 90,000 jobs, the employment rate would go down a couple of tenths of a point. But the increase in jobs is just keeping up with population growth at the moment. So when you're moving all these pieces... Because each one of them has an impact or another on inflation. But the whole point is that the combination of all these pieces together are making it so that inflation has been going down and down and down and down and down consistently from when the time it was, it reached the peak of 8.1%. And now we're at 2.7 on the core and 2.5 on the core minus volatile products, which is exactly where we want to be. And now it looks like we might be entering a phase where the Bank of Canada may be doing rate cuts. 
expecting about two before the end of this year, probably half a point uh, in total. Uh, some uh, financial analysts are pressing uh, the bank to go further and faster. One that's particularly, I don't know if I would if hawkish or bullish applies in, in, in this case, because uh, I mean, think hawk's hawk is up and bull is down but maybe vim can help me on that one um but is saying the bank of canada should be cutting 1.5 percent right now that's probably not gonna happen uh, but yes some experts are saying that you know we have room to cut up to 1.5 percent now right now we'll probably only cut about at maximum uh three quarters of a percent until the United States stop starts to drop some it's itself to not have a gap that's greater than 1% between the two countries. Right now we already have, do have a spread of 0.25. Uh, so it does leave some room and the United States' inflation numbers weren't as good as ours. So their rate cut uh, has been delayed uh, according to experts from uh, this summer till November, um, which means if they only get one or two in by the end of the year, but as soon as they start cutting one, if they cut one, then that, that allows the Bank of Canada to make another cut. Um, so we could get to a 1.5% uh, decrease by the end of, if not, uh, definitely not this year, but by maybe mid next year, uh, if the United States does start cutting theirs as well sometime in November. Um, so yeah, so we'll be going in to uh, the final 16 or seven months prior to an election if we are going to have an election at the scheduled time in october with inflation if things if the current trends continue may may being at normal rates and um interest rates may be being down uh, about one percent maybe up to one and a half by the time election comes down maybe even a little more uh costs of servicing the debt will have gone down so the federal government might be um, reporting better than expected financial performance with regard to adding the debt. So a lot of the arguments that uh, uh, the conservatives are using, you know, the inflation is doing this and the interest rates are doing that, a lot of those arguments will be, uh, will not be as powerful come election time. And uh, all these all these numbers and metrics if these trends continue and there's nothing that you know, comes out of the blue to T-bone us as a surprise, is uh, that's going to create a mood that uh, that is getting more positive uh, within the, the consumer. So I would expect that consumer confidence uh, ratings and whatnot would be going up around that time. Uh, so um, like I said, um, when we're looking at the numbers, you know, uh, don't think don't think this is baked in yet. I was. Um, writing a episode description for a show we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I was uh, mentioning specifically uh, at this time why it is I wasn't uh, believing that the 20% lead was inevitable because, you know, for example, there's the U.S. election to come. And if Donald Trump gets elected, that will probably change the political landscape right over overnight and how people will want to vote and if it's biden it might have another influence so we want and people might feel that we might be if people want to change and take a chance knowing that the united states is stable that might give them more permission that type of stuff so there's a lot of factors yet we still don't know uh, you know there's things that might still happen uh, in ukraine there's things that might be happening in israel that might uh, change uh, a lot um it seems that um According, I think it is to Abacus data, there should be some data coming out soon if it hasn't already, to suggest that um, another reason to not buy the numbers is that while the prime minister's numbers or net negativity, favorability, is, um, is, not, uh, is not great, the numbers are low. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, there's a bit of a feedback if you uh, could maybe mute until that you get that fixed or something. Um, sorry, um, so the prime minister's net favorables are terrible, but that's after eight years of being in office through some pretty shitty conditions. I mean, when you think when you ran on sunny ways 
no, no, no. Like <laughs> about a year and a year and something later, you get four years of Trump who's trying to kneecap your economy. You have Xi Jinping trying to kneecap your economy <laughs> and trying to impose China law here. And then a pandemic that shuts down the entire. Yeah. So uh, eight years in pretty shitty conditions. And Pierre Polyev uh, has been leader of the party for about one year or not even a full year yet. And his net negatives are pretty much the same. So the 20 point lead is not because anybody likes Pierre. The Canadian public doesn't like them. Canadian public doesn't trust him. He's just different. So that means when, when we're sad, when, when I'm asking like, why are the conservatives doing this? They're competing. They're, they're not running like they're 20 points ahead. It's because they're 20 points ahead, but they don't like, no Canadians don't like their leader any more than they like Justin Trudeau. So that whole campaign, well, Canadians are tired of Justin Trudeau. They don't want to, well, they don't want Pierre either. So it's almost like the Canadian version of the United States thing where nobody wanted Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, but that's what they're getting. <laughs> anyway, not much you can do about that, though. Really, I mean, like this, right well, it's like the, but it's like this. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants Pierre Polyev, and if we believe that nobody wants Justin Trudeau, but that's what we're getting. So, at some point, Canadians are going to start comparing the two, and it seems that according yeah. to that data, uh, there's some early signs that the 18 to 29 year old demographic is starting to slip from Polyev. Like I said, it's just an initial number, so maybe it's not. But again, like we mentioned on the show, uh, when you have these campus demonstrations, Israel and Palestine, and the Conservative Party of Canada, and the leader of the party is all in <laughs> for Israel. Mm. And the ICC thing is not going to help with that. Right? If the International Criminal Court actually does issue those warrants, I mean, just the fact that the charges were being considered in charges for Hamas and the Netanyahu it's government were going studies, to be... Pardon? That's precedent setting, is it not? Yes, it is. That they came out at the same time. It, yeah. has never hap it has never happened that both sides in a conflict will be served warrants at the same time. Again, it's not confirmed. I... I there's something I learned yesterday, which was really interesting, is that the prosecutor that asked for the warrants, filed for the warrants, actually went to CNN and granted an interview and was talking as if the warrants were granted. Which is one hell of a ballsy move to actually apply for a warrant for a panel of judges at the International Criminal Court, no less, and go on TV and pretty much talk as mm -hmm. if it's a done deal that you're going to get it. I'll be back. I gotta that would, take care of something. Yeah. That would create the impression that someone's trying to, trying to apply uh, a little bit of pressure on that uh, panel of judges. And uh, if there's one thing uh, we know about judges is that they are fiercely independent and don't like that. So, um, gee, <laughs> not, uh, uh, that move took some balls. Let's just put it that way. So, uh, but uh, in Canada, one of the important things that the federal government seemed to talk about was uh, the illusion of equivalency by doing that and how it's like so completely terrible uh, that this would be the case, uh, that these things would come out at the same time and you know people would think about that. Um, I listened to, um, I don't know if anybody listens to The Bridge with Peter Mansbridge, but yesterday uh, he had Janice Stein on, and uh, she's a brilliant mind uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff. And uh, I learned a lot of stuff that I didn't know. So uh, if you listen to it, I'm sorry, this is going to sound a little redundant, but I wanted to share some stuff with you that I learned from this, which will help understand this. And, and the reason I want to mention this is, again, these things are complicated, but that which is happening in Israel right now and that helicopter crash in Iran, um, they have the potential to change a lot. A lot. Uh, over the next uh, few months and, and very quickly in terms of uh, world dynamics. Um, so governments have to be 
nimble and clever and strategic in how they respond to things, uh, to not want to get ahead of things before they happen so that they're not caught off guard. And, um, but so with that as a framing it, uh, according to um, Janice Stein, uh, the International Criminal Court is interesting in that it its decisions are legally binding, but it has no independent arrest power. It has no enforcement availability. It has no cops. So it is dependent on the goodwill of its members and signatory states to the treaty. So the 124 countries uh, have signed on to it. Canada is one. In fact, Canada was among the leading states that created the court when Lloyd Axworthy was foreign minister. Since the ICC cannot go to Israel or to Gaza to arrest anybody, what this is essentially is that it's a travel ban for all intents and purposes. It makes it to make it very concrete, she says, should the Prime Minister of Israel come to Canada as a signatory to this treaty, we would be legally obligated to arrest and detain the Prime Minister and we'd have to send him for trial to The Hague. Right. Now, she also believes, like we stated on the show yesterday, uh, she says, quote, This prime minister I don't believe can last, but I'd be stunned if he were prime minister a year from now. He can't leave the country. He can go directly to the United States, but that's about it of any major powers. He can't leave the country, and once he's no longer prime minister, he faces criminal prosecution inside Israel. So this is a desperate moment for him. There's no question about it, and the country wants him gone. It's the only thing that unifies this country. There are two things that unify the country right now. Overwhelmingly, they want him gone, and they want the hostages back. So there you go. Now, uh, we mentioned yesterday uh, that uh, it seems that his coalition cabinet is fraying because Benny Gantz, who is sort of like the more moderate uh, one out of the, the group, uh, is not comfortable with what's going on, and he issued an ultimatum. Um, he said that uh, I think June 8th was his ultimate date by which Netanyahu has to deliver a plan for post-war Gaza, and if he doesn't, Gaza's going to walk it. He's going to walk. Gantz is going to walk out of that coalition. So you might be hearing a lot lately about uh, meetings between uh, officials in the United States, especially officials in Canada, with Benny Gantz on the side over the next few weeks and months because uh, they might be looking at uh, succession because Gantz, it would seem that if Israel has to go into an election again, would probably then be the contending uh, the front runner for prime minister in that case. Um, there's been a lot of pressure on Gantz from a lot of people, both in inside, in and outside Israel, to make a split from Netanyahu, which would be the thing that could bring Netanyahu's leadership to a conclusion, says uh, Janice Stein. Uh, in addition, uh, we have to remember that uh, the warrants requested were not only for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but the Defense Minister Yohav Gallant. Uh, and... Um, he, it's really interesting that he's named there because he's more moderate than Netanyahu and he's been explicitly seeking assurances from Netanyahu that there will not be any military occupation of Gaza by Israel after this, that there would be a withdrawal. I'm guessing he's not getting that. If he's thinking of walking away, I'm guessing he's not getting those assurances. Uh, now, you have to understand that uh, in this case, there's a war cabinet, and the war cabinet only includes Gallant, Gantz, and Netanyahu, and then there's the broader cabinet. So the war cabinet, them two walking away, can't uh, make the government fall apart. Uh, it would have to come from cabinet itself. Um, no. So there's... And there needs to be five defections from Netanyahu's government for it to fall. But if Gantz does uh, abandon Netanyahu, that means Netanyahu will be unconstrained by anything within his own cabinet uh, and within the war cabinet, because the war cabinet will just be him. Uh, and that means that uh, if there's absolutely anything within Israel that is... Uh, restraining him from going all out, uh, that would be gone because he would be uh, dependent on the 
most radical, the most violent of them. Uh, the most notable of them is uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, who's the Minister of National Security of Israel. He has a uh, particularly um, remarkable reputation as uh, not being very pro Palestine. Let's put it that way. Uh, It's important to note that Netanyahu and Gallant would be charged individually. Israel would not be charged as a nation in this case. Um, according to uh, Jana Stein, when asked, uh, Peter Mansbridge specifically asked her, what is Netanyahu's resistance to coming up with a post-war plan for announcing, or announcing a post-war plan? And this is um, interesting. She goes, this goes right to his DNA. This has been a 20-year-old struggle for him. He does not want an independent Palestinian state. He believes that is a mortal threat to Israel long-term security. He doesn't want it. He opposes it. I think it's the one commitment that I could say honestly Netanyahu has held firm to. Everything else is negotiable, but that's the one anchor that shaped his policies and his constituency does not want Palestinian sovereignty over the West Bank. Gaza is not the big story for them. It's the West Bank, which is the site of important religious symbols within the Jewish tradition. That's the stumbling block. So how can you plan for a day after if you don't want an independent Palestinian state? That's a big question. So according to her, this current moment is the biggest moment of Netanyahu's career and the most important one since the October 7th crisis. Uh, she says, he's famous for having nine lives. Every time people like me have counted him out, he rises from the ashes. Again, that's the record. I think this is it, and I would count him out. I do not believe he will be prime minister a year from now. Now, on the issue of equivalency, which we mentioned, uh, and uh, Mr. Grizzly asked that, and it's true, Israel is complaining about equivalency because never before in history had both sides in a war faced warrants from the International Criminal Court delivered at the same time. Now, from a legal and political perspective, Jana Stein says, quote, these allegations against Hamas are important because if you look, for instance, at the protest movement that has occurred on campuses, like mine, and more generally, it's been genocide in Gaza, right? So just to take a step back for a moment, the prosecutor could have charged Israel with genocide. He did not. The charges are serious, but they're not genocide, and the charges against Hamas are as serious, if not more so. So that puts two sides back in the story, which has largely been absent politically over the last three or four months. This is really, in a sense, the first time, uh, what language do you want to use here? A resistance movement, a terrorist group? We're describing the same people, just from different perspectives, has been charged by the court. Interesting who they charge. The two senior military figures, that's Yahya Sinwar and Mohammed De Deif, uh, but also Ismail Haneya, who's the senior political officer in Hamas. Wow, that's a blanket condemnation here, and where this will cause concern again is about the broader political future of Hamas. It's not about only the military, and what this says is that the military wing has put the broader political future of Hamas at risk, because Hamas has a political wing and uh, a military wing. You know, um, sorry, yeah, so it puts the broader political future of Hamas at risk. Um, is Erdogan going to charge Hanaya if he travels? I don't think so. Is Moscow going to charge him? I don't think so. There are a whole group of countries, Qatar, where they will not because these are not signatories to the court. But this is a political blow to the legitimacy of Hamas. There's no question, as it is to Israel's. So the important thing here is that where people are saying that it's equivalent because they came out at the same time, Janice Stein is making the point that while the charges did come out at the same time, Israel was not charged with genocide. And when you compare the charges to Israel to the charges to Hamas, the charges for Hamas are more serious, even though the charges for all are serious. But the charges uh, that are being, um, uh, the warrant that is being sought and the charges that are laid out in them that could apply if the warrant is granted are more serious crimes uh, for Hamas. So, for example, for the government of Israel, I think it's something, stuff like, um, you know, um, uh, blocking uh, the access of aid 
and, and, and the entry of aid and that type of stuff, whereas for Hamas, it literally is war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Israel using starvation as a weapon of war and uh, impeding the entry of aid. Uh, those are the, the charges being considered there, but yeah, Hamas, uh, crimes against humanity and, uh, war, and war crimes. So uh, in that sense, there actually is no equivalency. So when you hear the argument being made, especially by the people who are I don't want to say they're all pandering to the Jewish community because I'm sure there's got to be some that truly, truly, truly do believe it. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, going out there and again saying like this, yes, they're treating it like they're equivalents and like this, they aren't. So if somebody is actually saying that already, they're trying to somehow put a new frame on it in order to deceive people. So you have to ask, What's the motive and who benefits? Here. Um, now, the federal government uh, has also made a, a statement with regard to that. Um, uh, the equivalency of uh, the Prime Minister uh, had mentioned uh, had mentioned it. I, I don't have the quote, unfortunately, right next to me. Uh, sorry. Uh, but yes, uh, he, he mentioned that he, uh, he found that uh, the equivalency being made concerning. Um, I'm guessing that that is going to be the standard line uh, for those who have to ride the center um, because they're not going to oppose the warrants. You have to remember that uh, Canada broke from its tradition and abstained at the United States General Assembly not that long ago when there was a vote on uh, increasing uh, rights for Palestinian representation within uh, the UN instead of uh, voting with uh, Israel and the United States against the move. They didn't vote for it, but they abstained. So we know the government of Canada also, as a signatory and one of the founders of the International Criminal Court, um, the government of Canada would not be able to take a public stance against the warrants being issued. So they need to criticize something. So it'll be the, the alleged equivalency. On the conservative side, the whole point of equivalency will be to, can you believe they said that they're equal? Oh my God. The ICC is trying to claim that the Jewish people are just as bad as Hamas. They're going to try and conflate the two. Right? But once again, the Netanyahu government is not the Jewish people. Just like Hamas and not the Palestinian people. So uh, be careful when you hear the word equivalency and, uh, and how it's used, because if it's used to say, well, oh, well, tisk tisk, then that's a government that supports the warrant. And if it's from the point of view of, oh, my God, this is just more proof that, well, you know, we have to walk away from the ICC. It's now a Jew hatred place. Then you know they're, uh, it's, it, well, it's not serious. It's not a serious statement at this point. Because um, the, the International Criminal Court is kind of a very serious body. Right? Um, so, yeah. But equivalency is going to be the key word over the next few days, so uh, keep your ears open, and uh, if it is mentioned, uh, please pay attention to how it is being used and for what purpose it is being raised, whether or not it is, it is to inflame or whether or not it is to create the uh, impression that the government is still open to being able to discuss and uh, uh, speak from both perspectives, from the perspective of the Palestinians and the perspective of uh, Jewish people, instead of uh, 
four or one um, leadership specifically. Um, moving away from that, uh, with regard to the um, helicopter crash in Iran, um, because she mentioned she talked about this as well. Um, uh, oh, before we go, that kid James has a great comment here. It's not all or nothing proposition. You can criticize both sides for different reasons, not better or worse reasons. Exactly. Boom. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody's responsible for their own behavior and their own choices and how they respond. Um, with the government of Iran, uh, Jenna Stein uh, said it was very, very interesting to her that the government of Iran did not first resort to some type of conspiracy theory to explain the crash, because that usually is the go-to play in Iran. Uh, if we're going to talk about the expression, never let uh, the opportunity for a good crisis go to waste, uh, if something like that had happened, why not blame it on someone to create a pretext to gain some type of advantage. Uh, they have it. Uh, so this is, you know, when I say uh, pay attention to new behavior, it would seem that this is new behavior to which one should pay attention. Um, the other bit of new behavior is that it seems that the government of Iran and the governments of the United States have been talking a lot through back channels uh, throughout all of this um, to make sure that uh, either side is clear that, uh, hey, no, no, this wasn't us, or yes, this is us, but we're only going to go this far because we need to provide some type of response, right? But so just, but it seems that, oddly enough, there's a bit of a pragmatic rapprochement between, the Israel, between Iran and the United States with regard to this. It seems that both of them want to contain this as much as possible, which is good. Um, not really reported because we talked about uh, the foreign minister and uh, the prime minister, but there were others. There were six other officials on the helicopter. So, um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm seeing. James said the assassination of the president makes Iran look weak, even if they believed it was Israel. So I don't think they would say so publicly, at least not yet. Okay, if there was going to be an if it were if it were an assassination, it would have made Iran. Yes, I could I, I could see that. Yes, that's a that's a good point there. Um, I had to understand it because it seems like the way it was written gave me the impression that this you were saying that it was an actual assassination but i understand i get the turn of phrase now yes if a, if a, in general in theory if there was going to be an assassination of the president of iran it would make them look weak absolutely so they wouldn't admit it um but this it this it's new behavior it is definitely new behavior uh now in iran itself but but the the united states is also corroborating sorry that it has it's monitoring developments and it also has no information to suggest that it was anything other than an accident and there is an investigation underway into the crash now there's a lot of opposition to rahisi in iran because he is seen as one of the people that led the crackdown uh against protests uh uh, with regard to, to women's rights. And it seems that in the first hour after the announcement came out, there were pictures of young people dancing in the streets posted all over social media, and those disappeared very, very quickly, <laughs> according to Janice Stein. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the dancing in the streets was because he's accused of being one of four clerics that approved the execution of literally hundreds of political prisoners who were arrested in the streets in earlier rounds of demonstrations. So he's the lightning rod. Uh, and this is not lightning rod used in a pejorative uh, sense. It's just as a as a as a as a visual. He was the lightning rod for much opposition. Uh, now, as we mentioned, uh, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has a difficult situation to navigate. He's 85 and apparently not well. Um, but the main reason is because of voter turnout in Iran has plummeted. It used to be like in the 70 percent, and now it's in the 41 percent range or something like that, because not voting is the only way that people have to show dissatisfaction or any type of dissent with the government. So um, it seems that under Khamenei, 
uh, when there comes elections, choices have been narrowed. They have something called a council of electors, and which disqualifies, you know, whoever they think they think is too dangerous or too strays too far from the party line from being able to compete. So, uh, but there was a time where you had reformist presidents. Now, again, presidents don't have much power in Iran. Uh, it's the Supreme Leader and the Revolutionary Guard pretty much together. Uh, so they could afford the luxury of having more reformist prime ministers now and then. And that was an option every now and then. But since 2011, that is not an option uh, in elections there. So um, by narrowing the choice, um, he's um, He's losing the capacity, as she, uh, Janice Stein calls it, he's losing the capacity to connect to the Iranian body public. Uh, and he is unhappy about the low turnout. So because he knows what that means. The people are not considering him a legitimate. Now, Iran is not helped by the fact, according to Janice Stein, quote, no friend of Iran that is trusted by its government has any interest in democratic elections. <laughs> Vladimir Putin does not, Xi Jinping does not. The government that's most interesting to watch is the one of Turkey, where Erdogan has maintained an open democratic process. He's lost control of some of Turkey's big cities. Mayors have been elected that are opposed to him. But, quote, he's the only one that could conceivably intervene. But let me put it this way. The club within which Iran moves is not one that is going to warn Khamenei about the dangers of narrowing and narrowing the political process. <laughs> so, in other words, uh, if he wants some real talk, He's going to have to, the Supreme Leader is going to have to talk to someone who is not a friend. Because most likely his allied nations are going to blow sunshine up his butt on this one. Uh, the other big factor, according to Janice Stein, is the Revolutionary Guards, because they've grown more important as Iran has become more isolated. Uh, and uh, she mentions uh, something that's not talked about much is that the fact that the Iranian currency has fallen 90% in value over the last year, which frankly wipes out any middle class assets. Um, it's basically corrosive. So right now that's led to the creation of huge black markets in Iran. Uh, and uh, as that has happened, the Revolutionary Guard has strengthened its influence over Khamenei. And it's, uh, so there's probably not any opening there. Um, now, the other thing is that the new president has to be named in about 50 days, and there's a bit of a power vacuum. And uh, Khamenei, there's, like, as we mentioned yesterday, there is chat about um, his son being the successor. But that would cause, when we were mentioning it yesterday, and we thought, hmm, that's going to cause some hackles. Well, it seems that historically, recently in Iran, there's actually been a conservative pressure to move away from the concept of dynastic succession. And this would bring this right back. Uh, so it would be one thing if somebody didn't want them, but it would be, it's another thing when the, it's been expressly stated in the country that there's a desire and we need to move away from this, and we are going to be moving away from this, and we start moving away from this for a while, but not long after we say, no, we're going to go back to that. That will cause some people to not be happy and to raise some voices. Um, so there you go. That's all the stuff that's going on uh, in those two parts of the world, and uh, I know that took a lot of time, but there was some really good information, and it's important to understand it uh, because uh, our government is going to be placed um, in some situations where they're going to have to take some positions. And again, because we live in a pluralistic nation where we have a significant population that is of the Jewish faith and we have a significant population that is Muslim, um, our government has to be able to speak to both, has to be able to serve all Canadians. And therefore, in, is forced to walk a middle path that is extremely unsatisfying, extremely unsatisfying to those who want the government to take their side. You know, um, Arab Canadians and Jewish Canadians have people who are people they love very, very, very much and they're worried about. 
that are caught up in this. And they don't want the people they love and they care about to be at risk. And they want somebody to be able to do something about it. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a normal human reaction, right? So, uh, but yeah, it, it, it'll create a situation where the federal government is going to be, again, if you're talking about interests, trying to be, a, be considered an honest broker so that when there comes to time, to intervene that could make a difference that they can have somebody's ear and that means not going all in for one side or the other and um, which means that people that just want their government to say I've got I've got you I've understand I've got you and I will do all I can I'm on your side are not will not be satisfied at all because they can't get that 100% unequivocal commitment. Uh, and recently there was some polling, and I'm looking for it here. There it is. Um, that shows that this polarization is a thing like na nationwide. Quote, according to uh, Rafi Bujikanian from CBC, a new poll suggests Muslim and Jewish voters are leaning away from the federal liberals in voting attentions, a possible sign that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's efforts to straddle gaps in public opinion over the Israel Hamas are falling short. The new poll of voting attentions by the Angus Reid Institute says the federal NDP is leading the liberals among Muslim voters, 41 to 31 percent, while the federal conservatives are beating the liberals among Jewish voters, 42 to 33 percent. So when you're looking at our leaders, right, Jagmeet Singh, is really like when the warrants, the news of the warrants came out, he was like, good. Yes. The prime minister was, you know, more like, it's like, it's almost like, it's really sad that we have to, we, we have to, we have to be at this spot, but here we are. Uh, but oh my God, I can't believe the, they're doing this at the same time, and it looks like they're treating this like it's equivalent because it, this is not an equivalent. And then you have the conservatives going, my God, I can't believe the ICC did that. How terrible. So the conservatives have been Canadians of the Jewish faith who want the government to be 100% on their side with no nuance or whatnot. Yes. They're flocking to conservatives. Thanks in Canadians that want the government to be 100% on the side of Palestinians and declare this a genocide and, you know, divest everything from Israel and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, they're moving to the NDP, but that's because their leaders are, have been playing uh, the little pipe and come to me, my little children. Now, I would personally believe Mr. Singh is much more sincere about the Palestinian support than Mr. Polyev is about the support for the Jewish community. Because as we mentioned many times, when came time to put money where his mouth is, uh, he did not vote for funding for a Holocaust museum or a Jewish community center. So, um, Quote, this does feel to the liberals in terms of their outreach around diaspora politics to now be a fairly untenable situation, Sachi Curl, president of the Angus Reid Institute, told CBC News. Quote, the Jewish diaspora is now saying you haven't gone far enough in condemning Hamas and condemning the violence and stopping anti-Semitism in Canada. And you've got pro-Palestinian voters and populations, many of whom are Muslim, obviously saying you haven't gone far enough to condemn Israeli defense forces for its counterattack in Gaza. The data shows only 15% of Muslims polled said they would vote for the conservatives, while just 20% of Jewish voters said they would support the new Democrats. So it's not the majority of them. But again, in a game where a couple of percentage points here or there can make the difference, these are voters, if that's their, if they're going to be single issue voters, and that's going to be the key issue that the liberals will not be able to get back because the liberals are not about to go all in on one side or another. They're, they're just not. Uh, 
Carl said that under Trudeau's leadership, the Liberals had made concerted effort to appeal to Muslim voters since 2015 when the Conservatives under Stephen Harper ran an election campaign that included controversial promises like a ban on the kneecap and barbaric cultural practices tip line. An Environics Institute poll looking back at that election found 65% of Muslims who said they they voted cast their ballots for the Liberals while only 10% voted for the NDP. So, yes. There we go, 10% for the NDP. Uh, I was trying to compare the, the previous numbers to see if uh, what it was before, but it was... Um, uh, the, numbers they, the numbers they gave were uh, for... Um, Jewish voters supporting the New Democrats and not Muslim voters in the first number, so I couldn't uh, compare them. Um, she said the liberals appear to be feeling the fallout from trying to appease both Muslim and Jewish voters. Yeah, yeah, that's all the kind of stuff. I said that already. That's just a repeat in the article. Uh, asked at a news conference Thursday about his party's apparent slide among Muslim and Jewish voters, Trudeau defended the liberals' approach and accused the other parties of picking sides while he has been striving for unity. Quote, to put it in political terms, I think it's important that there be at least one major party in this country in our democracy that has both lots of Jewish MPs and lots of Muslim MPs, he said, adding that he will continue to advocate for a two-state solution and a ceasefire. Bam. In December, CBC News reported a group representing influential Canadian Muslim donors was leaving the top donor ranks of the Liberal Party, citing Trudeau's disinclination at the time to call for ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas conflict. The government started to call for one a few days later after that announcement. Hmm. In February, hundreds of mosques and Muslim organizations co-signed a letter telling Canadian MPs not to appear at mosques during Ramadan, sorry, unless they were willing to openly call out Israel for war crimes or demand the government stop sending weapons to Israel. The Liberals have pointed out that they have not exported lethal aid to Israel since the start of this latest conflict and also voted in favor of a heavily amended NDP motion that called on Canada to, quote, cease the further authorization and transfer of arms exports to Israel. That motion outraged many Jewish Canadians, quote, we are deeply disappointed that the Liberal government has chosen to effectively subcontract Canadian foreign policy to anti-Israel radicals within the NDP and the Bloc Québécois, the Centre for Israel and Jewish Affairs said in a media statement at the time. The Palestine Solidarity Network and activist groups said it was not surprised to hear the Muslim vote seems to be swinging away from the Liberals. Quote, People are upset and we only see a few of these watershed moments in our lifetimes, one of the group's national leader, Yuhi Sohani, told CBC News. Her organization's goal is to get MPs to call for a permanent ceasefire, an end to the ongoing siege in Gaza, a two-way arms embargo on Israel, and a Palestinian state. It is targeting the Liberal MPs who won by narrow margins in swing ridings in 2021, it hopes to gather enough signatures in each writing to put pressure on sitting MPs. Sahani said the group is giving MPs a really clear choice. Quote, it's either answer or be in line with our demands or you won't win your seat next election, she said. Angus Reid also polled respondents on their opinions of Trudeau, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. 51% of Muslims said their opinion of Trudeau had worsened recently, according to the Institute, while a similar share, 47%, said the same about Polyev. Again, if they're both disappointing groups at the same rate, then how can this thing be the deciding factor? It's going to have to be something else, right? 47% of Muslim respondents said their opinion of Singh had not changed. Among Jewish voters, 49% said their opinion of Trudeau had worsened, a slightly lower number. 38% said the same of Singh. A quarter of Jewish respondents said their opinion of Polyev had improved, but 31% reported the opposite. So he's still net negative six. But he might have been net negative way more, way more than that. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Carl said the data held no big surprises given recent events. You just see the hill that the liberals now have to climb or call it the corner they have painted themselves into, she said. So yeah, these, um, these dynamics that are going on in other places in the world are polarizing our communities here. And now we have the data. It's maybe not as much as would uh, as, the, as we would have the impression it is given by the U.S. coverage and how much attention it's getting. Um, but yeah, there's a when people you love are in danger, you're probably not. You don't probably don't really care about nuance. But a federal government 
has to abide by international law and has to govern for all its citizens and has to be realistic about what it is it can accomplish when it comes to uh, acting on the world stage. So, um, yeah, I do not envy uh, the government of Canada at this particular moment in time having to make uh, these types of decisions and have to walk this line because you go into it knowing that there's absolutely no way to satisfy everyone. And you also go into that knowing that if you're a responsible government, there's also no way you can uh, just go all in for one side. It just... (laughs) It's a... It's not an easy time to be a world leader. Um, Just so you know, a little development here. Uh, Israel, in response to all of this, has recalled its ambassadors from Spain, Norway, and Ireland because uh, all three of those nations, (laughs) sorry, (coughs) had a coordinated announcement that they will be formally recognizing Palestine as a state next Tuesday. Um, The conflict, the Prime Minister of um, Ireland, Simon Harris, says, To the people of Israel, I say today, Ireland is resolute and unequivocal in fully recognizing the state of Israel and Israel's right to exist securely and in peace with its neighbors. Let me be clear, Ireland condemns the massacre carried out by Hamas on the 7th of October last. Um, Spain's leader told his parliament that the two-state solution mustn't be destroyed by force and that Israel has no plan for peace. Uh, The Israel foreign minister, Israel Katz, said that the call for Palestinian statehood would impede efforts to return the hostages still being held in Gaza, and he says that it makes a ceasefire less likely by, quote, rewarding the jihadists of Hamas and Iran. Most of the UN countries are in favor of recognizing Palestine as a state, given uh, the recent vote at the the General Assembly, uh, but that vote had been uh, vetoed by the United States at the time. Um, So there you go. That's uh, the most uh, so the big stuff that we have uh, for that. Um, in uh, Nova Scotia, according to the CBC, it seems that uh, seven years ago there was a commitment made to make the province fully accessible by the year 2030. And uh, according to CBC, uh, the province is going to have to admit that it cannot meet that target. Um, It was in 2017 that the province passed the Accessibility Act and uh, it had given themselves 13 years at the time to make it sure, uh, make sure that the province was accessible. Uh, Don Stegan, who is an executive director in the Department of Justice, says that they've taken steps to speed up the process, but the province won't be barrier free by that date. Instead, they say that they will have enforceable accessibility standards enacted by 2030, and they're claiming that 2030 was, uh, well, basically, uh, that 2030 was an aspirational goal and a key milestone to have all six standards enacted with compliance and enforcement in place. Um, but they don't, uh, but they don't have it quite yet. Uh, they didn't say that they're abandoning the project, but it is definitely delayed. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, um, according to, um, Victoria Levac, who's a disability advocate, uh, in the province, uh, she says, um, it's just spin that it's an aspirational goal. No, you're just saying that because you can't meet it. And you know that now. Because at the time, they weren't talking about it as an aspirational goal. And I think the disability community would remember how it was talked about when it was announced. Um, Also, uh, big news. um, In Haiti, uh, it seems that there is a a key delegation from Kenya that has arrived. If you'll remember, um, last October, I think it was, the UN Security Council had voted to authorize a multinational force to go to Haiti uh, for a one-year deployment uh, that would be led by the Kenyan police and uh, in order to establish order. 
uh, because armed gangs in uh, Paul Prince now control large parts of the country, of the capital and the country. And um, there's spiraling gang violence. Uh, I mean, everything is all the possible worst things that you could imagine people doing to each other are, are being done there. Um, so it seems that there's a delegation from Kenya. Uh, I'm not sure if they've landed yet or, or they are about to. Uh, but uh, things are going to start moving on the island. Um, Kenyan's president, William Ruto, is, will be in Washington, D.C. to meet with President Joe Biden today. Uh, and they'll be focused on the efforts to restore order in Paul Prince. Uh, Kenyan police are supposed to arrive there soon, and they will be leading a multinational police mission um, on the ground. Uh, this mission has been delayed. It was supposed to happen a little earlier, uh, but it seems that uh, they've got all the key players um, the police um, action or coordination is in the planning stages. Uh, there will be troops from Kenya, Bahamas, and Jamaica, and a number of other countries that are expected there. Canada has been heavily involved in the planning and training of the forces. Um, so we played a role there, and I, th I believe that we supplied um, uh, a frigate, I believe, also for monitoring, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Uh, we had reported on that at the time. Um, the team of Kenyan authorities is already in Porto Prince. Okay, so they have landed. Sorry, I wasn't sure if they had yet. And they are examining uh, the military equipment, armored vehicles, and other gear that have been delivered to Haiti over the past few weeks by U United States military cargo planes. Um, so the equipment is there. Uh, it seems that there are ships around monitoring. Uh, I'm guessing to check that maybe... Uh, Weapons of supplies that would help, uh, supplies of weapons, I should say, that would help uh, support the gangs there. Maybe don't get in. I'm not quite sure exactly or to even help with uh, maybe surveillance, that type of stuff. Um, but those uh, services, uh, that has been going on in the United States, seems to have been bringing in military equipment and uh, bringing it to the airport at the time and uh, making sure it could be stored safely until such time as the forces can be arrived, so at least they'll be able to hit the ground running uh, fairly quickly when they get there, especially if they've been trained beforehand, which it seems has been the case with Canada playing a role there. Um, on the good news side of this is that uh, for the first time in uh, the few months, and three months, uh, the airport in Pau Prince was open for commercial air travel. One flight took off, and it seems that there will be more to come. So uh, a little, little touch of restoration of normalcy uh, there. Uh, but there's still a long way to go. Hopefully, though, this will be the beginning of uh, the tide turning over there. Um, now, things have been uh, complicated there because it seems that um, in Haiti, there's been a lot of uh, migrants trying to escape across the border, uh, across the, the river, the border, and the bridge to the Dominican Republic. Uh, and, uh, of course, um, very few people have been allowed in. And uh, one of the main reasons for that is that uh, there was a presidential election in the Dominican Republic just this last weekend. And uh, the incumbent president, Abidaneer, um, Luis Abidaneer, uh, won that. But uh, during the election camp, because of this was happening, one of the things his party was doing was cracking down on a migration at the border. Uh, so I'm guessing uh, that might have an issue to do with capacity and that type of stuff. But I'm sure that the fact that there was an election going on was playing a role on that. So maybe now that he's been reelected, there might be a way uh, to accommodate more. We don't know. 
uh, but according to Al Jazeera here. Uh, Dominican Republic President Luis Abinader has won a second term in elections, clinching victory in the first round, according to preliminary results. The hugely popular president vowed unity and impartial leadership as he declared victory after rivals conceded on Sunday night, having secured a sufficiently wide margin to win without needing to go to a second round face-off. His win appears to be an endorsement of his handling of the economy and tough policies towards migration from neighboring Haiti. <laughs> With just uh, over half of the uh, voting centers reporting late on Sunday, Abinader held a 58.85% of the vote. His closest rival, three-time former president, Leonel Fernandez, was uh, on had 27.29%. Preliminary data from electoral authorities showed. While final results were pending, Abinader, 56, had clearly won well over the 50% needed to roll a runoff election. That prompted Fernandez and another rival, Abel Martinez, to, con to concede. Uh, let's see what else this article says here. Um, Today, our country shines with its own light, Abinader told supporters at the headquarters of his modern revolutionary party, pledging to serve as president for all citizens. He called for a country, quote, without distinction, without sectarianism, and without party colors. The re-elected head of the state also vowed to push through constitutional reform on the continuity of, pa continuity of power that would not rely on the personal whim of the president in office. He pledged that he would not run again after completing his second term. Presidents in the Dominican Republic are restricted to two, to two terms of four years. However, previous reforms have extended presidential mandates. While opposition parties reported a number of small irregularities, voting in the election largely ran smoothly. Many of the 8 million eligible voters are still troubled by an electoral authority decision to suspend the 2020 municipal elections due to a technical glitch, prompting what appears to be a high voter turnout. Okay. Voters said they felt satisfied with the electoral process, according to Luis Fortuno, an international observer for the election and a former governor of Puerto Rico. In general, the election process was carried out correctly, openly, and democratically, Fortuno said. There you go. On the issue of Haitian migrants, one of Latin America's most popular presidents, Abidanir, had approval ratings at about 70%, a Gallup poll showed in September. The election outcome reinforced his major policies, which included an anti-corruption agenda, a crackdown among the shared border with Haiti and the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of migrants fleeing the violence-stricken neighbor. Abinader, a U.S.-trained economist of Lebanese descent, was elected during the COVID pandemic in 2020 on promises of restoring trust in the government after several high-profile corruption scandals embroiling public officials in the top tourist destination. Once in office, he began, be gilding, he began building a 164-kilometer concrete wall across the border with Haiti. Oh, my word. <sighs> Man. Once in office, he began building a 164-kilometer concrete wall along the border with Haiti to keep out undocumented migrants. He had more than 250,000 migrants deported in 2023, despite international pressure for the country to welcome more refugees. Voter Willie Soto, 21, was among the crowd outside Abdenair's campaign headquarters. He voiced approval for the migrant crackdown. While saying he knows, quote, the policies against Haitians are very strict, he told the Associated Press News Agency that the steps the president has taken are important in guaranteeing the security of Dominicans like him. Quote, this isn't a problem that gets resolved one day to the next. The policies he's implemented, how he's cracked down, closed the border and built a wall, I feel like it was a good initiative to control the problem of Haitian migration. Ah, man. But... <clears throat> I am not happy about building walls, but if I were a Democrat right now, I would be making commercials. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's the pity person in me. It's like, <laughs> the president of the Dominican Republic, had, the Dominican Republic did it. You couldn't. I just, I don't know. Maybe it's not, but maybe it's just, maybe I'm just a little punch drunk at the moment and it's just amusing to me. But yeah, he actually built a wall. I did the things you learn. The things you learn. Because, I mean, when do we ever speak about the Dominican Republic, really? So, yeah. 
that's uh, the developments in Haiti. So that will be a lot in the news. Uh, and of course, Canada is playing a supporting role in there. So uh, you'll probably hear uh, uh, more and more. Uh, there'll be more opportunities for uh, the Minister of National Defense and the Prime Minister to be speaking about what is going on there. Um, let's see. What else have I got for you? Oh, you know, what? let's change the mood because uh, we have been talking about some very, very heavy stuff. Uh, so let's talk about something a little lighter, Kids and Cubs. And it is the fact that um, Barbie Mattel is coming up with a series of dolls that are uh, interesting. Um, uh, they are called, um, oh darn, what are they call it? Well, they're making um, Barbie versions of female athletes, world famous ones. And it seems that Canada's own Christine Sinclair is one of them. How about that? According to the Associated Press, Barbie dolls will honor Canadian soccer star Christine Sinclair and tennis champion Venus Williams, plus seven other athletes as part of Project announced by Mattel on Wednesday. The others being depicted as dolls are gymnasts Rebecca Andrade and Alexa Moreno, soccer player Mary Fowler, boxer Estelle Mosley, swimmer Federica Pellegrini, paratriathlete Susana Rodriguez, and track and field sprinter Iwa Swoboda. Throughout my career, I've always been driven by the idea of shattering glass ceilings and staying true to myself, and Barbie's mission couldn't resonate more deeply with that ethos, said Williams, who has won seven Grand Slam singles titles. The brand wanted to note, quote, the impact of sports in fostering self-confidence, ambition, and empowerment among the next generation, Mattel's Krista Berger said. I guess, and the, I wish I could show it to you, but if you go to CTV and look up an article that says Barbie will make dolls to honor Venus Williams, Christine Sinclair, and other athletes, uh, Christine Sinclair is actually posing with her doll, her version of her. It's wearing the number 12, red jersey, black shorts, uh, black soccer socks, and uh, I believe uh, there's a gold medal around her neck. Mattel even brought the bling, kids. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Okay, kids are, oh, kids are in, the, in, the, in the chat are talking. I, all I did was look at the chat, and I saw Car Car Carol go, brownies with black beans? What is this? And I've actually had brownies that were black bean brownies and they were ridiculously good it's counterintuitive you would not think just by talking about it but they were really really good so kitlin dam cassie lake i make brownies with black beans have you ever tried flowers chocolate cakes with yes please if anybody has a recipe i want one please i don't i do not have a gluten-free black bean brownie recipe so uh yeah true north eager weaver at gmail.com uh, if you've got one, please send it to me because I would like that very much. Um, sorry, just took a sidetrack, but uh, um, uh, I, I, I was uh, my chocolate and brownies were mentioned in the chat, and then my brain went squirrel. <laughs> oh yes, yes, Mister, yes, 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 of course, Mister Jim. Yes, it's Lori. Of course, that's where I had them the first time. I had forgotten. Yes. Ah, thank you so much. But please, uh, I would love that. Uh, and uh, yes, Kit Elaine, I remember seeing your thing that you wanted to see recipes. Uh, Kit Elaine has been very, very nice in sending me tons of gluten-free recipes for baking stuff that I have had not a moment of life <laughs> to be able to make an attempt. So it's not that I don't appreciate them. It's just, um, yeah. Time, time is short. Time is really short. I, I, for, for, I'm not a natural baker. Uh, so, you know, I'm, for me, I'm like measuring everything like right down to the line, being super careful because I know baking is chemistry. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so to take on a baking project, I have to find um, a little gumption. Because <laughs> uh, it's not, I, I have yet to make successfully bake a gluten-free bread with which I could not hammer nails. 
<laughs> so I have to be particularly motivated to give it a chance because often my attempts end up in utter failure. <laughs> but I do appreciate the recipes, but please, please do. Yes. Uh, because, yes, there will, there will come a time. I, I, I've also, the last uh, couple of years, been trying to watch my figure a little more because, you know, I've crossed 15. Uh, apparently, uh, now when I do eat a plate of brownies over the course of four days, it kind of shows up. <laughs> All right. Uh, kits and cups. Uh, in uh, other news, uh, it seems that uh, everybody is rested in the Trump trial. Um, will will not be a verdict by the end of this week because it seems that closing arguments have been scheduled for next week. Uh, it seems that Trump's team have had called two witnesses. One of them named Robert Costello, who, um, oh, how would we put it, um, didn't help. In any way, shape, or form. Uh, on the bench, he was rude, he was dismissive, he was petulant, he talked back, he made comments under his breath while the judge was making rulings. Uh, the judge had to clear the courthouse twice, uh, the courtroom twice, in order to uh, give special instruction directly to Mr. Costello and say, like, tell me you understand, like, let me hear it from my, your voice that you have understood clearly what I said. Because right now I'm finding you contemptuous. Which means that the next step is finding you in contempt of court. Uh, so yeah, basically this Robert Costello guy went on the stand and acted like Trump. Pretty much. Yeah. So, oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, Kit Elaine says, yes, if you are sending me recipes, yes, they must be flour-free. Uh, if, if, if the recipes are gluten-free like this, usually they are wheat-free because wheat has gluten. So to be gluten-free, it has to be wheat-free. Yes. But uh, I have no problem with gluten. Mine is, 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 uh, is wheat. So if there happens to be barley, oats, or rye uh, in the recipe, I personally am fine. All right. There you go. Um, so yes, it seems that... Uh, we have a situation that some uh, legal analysis have found interesting, basically saying, who would have thought going into this that uh, Michael Cohen would have been the one who remained polite and calm and poised throughout the entire cross-examinations and the testimony, even when uh, lawyers uh, cross-examining him uh, decided to ask him questions about his wife or his daughter not sure how those were relevant in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but uh, yes, Michael Cohen was uh, very respectful. And uh, when he was being asked questions like, well, it says there's this tweet here that says, you said this terrible thing about Donald Trump. And it's like, it was like did you say that? I said, yeah, it sounds like something I would say. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> see, uh, the uh, the defense is going to try to make the case that Michael Cohen can't be trusted, but the problem is, is that all the bad stuff said about Michael Cohen on the stand was said by Michael Cohen. He was like, yeah, I, I did that. Yeah, I broke that law. Yeah, there I lied. Yep. I called him that name. Yep. <laughs> he just said, he, so he basically admitted to like, all the things he did. It's like, but it still doesn't change the fact <laughs> that I did all this lying and cheating and whatnot at the request and for the benefit of Donald Trump. And I've gone to jail for it. So why shouldn't he? Right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, this guy did not help, did not help Mr. Trump whatsoever. I don't know what, to, and it seems that the lawyers uh, also sort of went too far and asked uh, one question too many while they were trying to, to make some stuff and uh, created some uh, openings. Uh, so uh, they had asked Michael Cohen, says, wouldn't you benefit from 
you know, Donald Trump can go to jail because, you know, you have your podcast and all that stuff and your merch and you've raised about $4 million for yourself and all of, with all of that. Wouldn't it be better for you? Wouldn't you, wouldn't it be financially advantageous for you, for Donald Trump to go to jail so you can market that? And he's just turned around the status. Of, uh, actually, no, if I think about it, probably be financially more beneficial for me if he actually was found not guilty. <laughs> Lawyers. Never ask a question to which you don't already know the answer. So, uh, yeah, Trump's lawyer got completely owned there. Uh, I don't think it's going <laughs> to. Like there, there could always be that one uh, juror uh, that is in the bag for Trump and you know, is looking to acquit him. But uh, if we do actually have 12 jurors that are going to look at what was presented, presented in the courtroom, um, yeah, Trump's goose is as good as cooked. So, uh, yeah, he wasn't very well served by his lawyers. By-election news, kids and cubs, because yesterday we mentioned uh, that there was a by-election in Peak 2 West, and uh, there was not much of a surprise. Um, the it, it was a strongly uh, progressive conservative uh, electoral district provincially, and it remains so. And uh, you could tell that uh, uh, the government was pretty confident because uh, Marco McLeod, Marco McLeod, who won, uh, was a political neophyte. And if it was going to be a tight race, then they probably would have looked for a uh, star candidate. But they were comfortable running a neophyte. So they, I'm guessing that they were pretty sure that it was going to be a safe riding and remain in the camps, uh, in the PC camp. But uh, according to CBC's and Julie Patil, Progressive candidate Marco McLeod has won the by-election in P2 West, according to unofficial results posted on Tuesday night by Elections Nova Scotia. McLeod had a significant lead over his opponents throughout the evening, with the NDP candidate in second place, the Liberals in third, and the Greens rounding out the field. Quote, all a person's got is reputation and work ethic, and I've been blessed to come from a family that has these attributes in spades, McLeod told a cheering crowd at a Pig Two restaurant, referencing the seventh-generation family farm where he lives and runs his own sawmill. Quote, we've been picking stones from the fields of McLeod Meadows for over 200 years, and here we are tonight. It took a lot. In an interview with CBC News, McLeod, who has also worked as an engineer and flight instructor, said he felt overwhelmed by the support in the room at his victory party. He said he's always had an interest in politics and loves Pitt to West. Quote, this is where I was born and raised and where I live, so I really want to represent the people here and improve life around here, he said. McLeod finished with 72.48% of the vote. Voter turnout was 48.09%. Now, that doesn't seem high, but 48.09% is, uh, is well, compared to what we've seen recently, is a uh, high for a by-election. Um, tonight, once again, the people had their say, and they said, we believe in the PC party and we believe in Marco McLeod, Premier Tim Houston said, ahead of McLeod's victory speech. Uh, also running uh, in, uh, oh my word, okay, yeah. If you look at the tallies, PC candidate Marco McLeod, 4,159 votes. NDP candidate Melinda McKenzie, 949 votes. It wasn't even close. Liberal candidate Mary Woodridge Elliott, 548 votes. And Green Party candidate Claire Brett, 82 votes. Um, so uh, the by-election was held to fail the seat held by the PC's Carla McFarlane, uh, who was Nova Scotia's first female Speaker of the House, and announced her retirement in April. And it seemed that uh, that announcement had come as a surprise. Um, when asked about McFarlane's time as an MLA, McLeod noted she was present in the community and someone who was easy to reach out to if needed. Quote, she would check up on neighbors when Hurricane Fiona blew through. She visited our farm, made sure everything was okay. So that meant a lot to us as constituents, and I hope to continue that. Um, there we go. Uh, let's see what else it says here. In a news release following the vote, Nova Scotia NDP acknowledged its candidate Melinda McKenzie had a strong showing with the second place finish ahead of the Liberals and the Green Party. Uh, the third place finish for the Liberals marks their second consecutive stinging result in a by-election. Last summer, the party finished third in the Preston by-election, a seat the Liberals previously held for 20 years. Two days' results saw the party slip from a second place finish in Pig 2 West in the 2021 provincial election to third, and its vote share plummeted to 9.5%. Because the party failed to reach the 10% threshold, its candidate will not qualify for a partial expense reimbursement from elections Nova Scotia. So uh, that is that news. Now, there have been uh, a couple of other by-elections also recently, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Uh, there were two in Ontario recently, 
And uh, we didn't uh, mention them, to be totally honest, because, um, well, everything that we expected to happen happened, and voter turnout was terribly, terribly low. Um, but reported on May 2nd, uh, there was a provincial by-election in Milton, um, and uh, it was not going to have any impact on the, on any the status of party standings in any major way here. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I was uh, drawing up uh, the article here and... Uh, Unfortunately, I, uh, I drew up the wrong, the incorrect one. Here we go. Um, according to the Globe and Mail, published May 2nd, Doug Ford's progressive conservatives candidates won both Ontario by-elections by convincing margins. So there were two. Uh, PC candidate Z Hamid, who has liberal roots, won by more than 2,400 votes or 9 percentage points over liberal Galen Naidu Harris and the writing of Milton, just west of Mississauga. Polls and observers suggested Milton would have been a tighter race as Liberals looked to make inroads in the 905 corridor around Toronto that the Tories have dominated for the last two elections. I feel great, Hamid said after his win. I think it's an affirmation of the great work that our PC party is doing in Ontario and people who voted to continue that. Sorry. <clears throat> I threw up in my mouth a little there. Uh, great work the PC party is doing in Ontario. Okay, uh, Fellow PC candidate Steve Pesano drew 57% of the votes in the Tory stronghold of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Ford celebrated the wins with Hamid at his victory party in Milton. Quote, we're, fortun we're fortunate, we're blessed, but we're very humbled about the victory, Ford said. We couldn't ask for two better candidates than Z and Steve. The Liberals finished securely in second in both by-elections, with the opposition New Democrats coming in a distant third. Quote, Tonight's results in Milton and Lambton, Kent, Middlesex send a strong message. Bonnie Crombie and Ontario Liberals are the only alternative to Doug Ford, the Ontario Liberal Party said in a statement. Ontario Liberals will continue to hold the Ford Conservatives accountable for choosing to reward their rich insider friends instead of fighting for the real people of Ontario. Not sure how credible that line is coming from Bonnie Crombie. But anyway... Milton has been vacant since Cabinet Minister Parm Gill resigned in February to join the federal Conservatives. Hamid, a three-term Milton councillor, donated to the Liberals as recently as 2022 and, uh, and unsuccessfully sought a federal Liberal nomination in 2015. So how much of a Conservative Hamid really is, we don't know. Uh, farther southwest, Lambton Kent Middlesex was held since 2011 by Monty McNaughton, who served in opposition for the Repressive Conservatives. McNaughton, a cabinet minister, was seen as a rising star on Ford's team before he resigned last October. Liberal candidate Kathy Bungard Jensen finished more, more than 9,000 votes behind Pesano and Ch Chatham Head Kent councillor as she collected 23% of the votes. Ford paid Milton a lot of attention during the by-election and the lead-up to it with announcements on Go Transit Service and Highway 413, and has had many cabinet ministers and other caucus members canvassing there. So I'm guessing he might have been really worried to uh, throw a, do a full-court press like that. While a Tory loss in Milton would not have affected Ford's majority, the party already lost a seat in a by-election last year that had been held by another cabinet minister and did not want to repeat. Ah, that's why. The narrative would have been awful. The by-election marked the first test for Crombie, who was crowned Liberal leader in December. The former Mississauga mayor considered then decided against running for the Milton seat herself. Quote, the path to victory is going to be won through the 905 as it has been for the Conservatives, and so holding on to the seat and doing quite convincingly at this stage should be really emboldening for the Conservatives, said Cameron Anderson, a political science professor at Western University. I see not a bad showing for the Liberals at just under 40%, but clearly not a breakthrough for the Liberals and clearly not a repudiation of the governing party at this time. So there you go. Um, yeah, uh, and apparently uh, I, th I think uh, voter turnout uh, for both of those um, was below 40%. Um, I'll just look this up for you kids very quickly and see if I can get it. Uh, to, 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 there we go, unofficial result for Lambton kicks. Yeah, 30.3% of people came out for the Lambton Middlesex, which is just ridiculously low. And uh, in Milton, voter turnout was... 
Like, come on, people. Fewer than 30% voted in the by-election in Milton. It's just... Uh, I'm... Come on, you gotta vote, Canada. You gotta vote. I just... Uh, Man. Uh, yesterday, the Prime Minister was in the United States in the state of Pennsylvania on a bit of a whirlwind tour where he met with Governor Shapiro. Uh, you will hear more and more of uh, cabinet ministers traveling to the United States to talk to their American counterparts. So if you will remember, when uh, Donald Trump was the president, uh, NAFTA came up for renegotiation. And one of the things that the federal government did during the renegotiation process a renegotiating process, sorry, I'm having trouble saying that word, renegotiating process, was travel down to the United States to deal with state representatives one-on-one -on -one to try to get them to make the case to the federal government about why it is that uh, you should probably not try to crush Canada in the trade deal because, you know, of interstate, interprovincial state and trade. Uh, it seems that given there is an election coming and Trump could possibly win, and the fact that NAFTA 2 is coming up for renegotiation in 2026, that they are starting to do that bit of a reconnaissance mission earlier. So they're going to the states now to start building the relationships. So these are trade solidification uh, missions uh, with the various uh, state governments and state governors in order to make sure that can that Canada and states can have uh, their interests well represented uh, when the, if should they have a federal government like uh, Trump who would want to randomly impose sanctions or tariffs or that type of thing uh, and not really caring because it makes him look tough to his own electorate even though it has negative, could have negative consequences for the actual uh, the states themselves, the state governments. So uh, this is starting earlier because it was very, very, very successful the first time around. That was one of the things that led to Donald Trump saying um, in an unhappy way that uh, Christian Freeland was very, 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 very tough uh, in that negotiation. So there we... Uh, so we will be seeing more of that over the the next uh, the next uh, weeks and months, trying to shore up. Uh, it's basically a, um, some preemptive uh, some preemptive I wouldn't say preemptive strikes, but um, coordination to make sure, like you know, it's like um, if we're doing you know heavy trade with Michigan or Montana in a specific product. Um, on a national scale, it may not look important, but to that particular state's economy, it might be vitally important. Therefore, an action on that, that wouldn't seem to be so bad if it was taken nationally. Um, well, now they have not only Canadians telling the federal government, saying, hey, you can't do that because we have a lot of trade with Montana on this. Representatives from Montana would be saying, hey. <laughs> it's like, you really can't do that to us because we need that trade with Canada. So it, it's 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 a, it's a smart way to do that. It's a very 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 smart way to do that, and um, again, just making sure that uh, we are taking care of the little things and preparing the terrain in case the worst case scenario happens. So this is a government that's uh, being proactive in this case, and uh, something that uh, again, when uh, people say that uh, this government is trying to make sure that they send the economy down to hell, this would be proof that uh, that is in fact not true. All right, uh, Kids and Cubs, uh, the show is, of course, going a little longer because uh, Mr. Grizzly is busy. Uh, he sent me a message saying, can't join at the moment. Let me know when you want to end the show. I'm swamped. Um, so uh, I might be trying to send him a message soon to let him know, but I, I've just been, I've had a lot of material accumulated over the last little while, so I figured it would be a good opportunity <laughs> to use it. Um, for those who are... Uh, into following the uh, 
the case uh, with regard to the extrajudicial killing of uh, Hardeep Singh Nijjar. Uh, the first court appearance of the four people charged took place in a courtroom in Surrey, British Columbia. Uh, three appeared by uh, one person, and the fourth person, who is currently being detained in Ontario, uh, appeared remotely through video link. Uh, there have been protesters from the Sikh community at um, the courthouse in Surrey, uh, where they've had signs and different things. Uh, and uh, one of the things that stood out is that they had a mannequin of Prime Minister Narendra Modi dressed in prison stripes and in handcuffs. So um, please um, don't hold back and let us know what you think of him, right? Yeet. Uh, the case has been adjourned to June 25th when it will continue. So um, pay attention to that. Um, there's also more controversy, well, an attempt to build some controversy around Speaker Greg Fergus, yet again from the Conservatives. It seems that there was an, uh, something posted to the Liberal Party of Canada's social media uh, for an event, uh, and uh, a fundraising event, I guess, of that type of thing. And it had generic wording about, you know, like, help us fight the, the Conservatives and whatnot that they would put for everyone. Uh, but it seems that when the Liberals did that, uh, because they did one for, I'm guessing, for every one of their MPs or something, or I'm not sure when they, when they have an event like that, they put it in. But the event was called uh, A Summer Evening with the Honorable Craig Fergus. And I guess they put that wording on the artwork, graphics, or whatnot they designed to promote that event and then put it on. And then someone said, oh, but wait a minute, this guy is the speaker, so maybe we shouldn't be put in the partisan language on that one. So uh, Greg Ferguson's office had nothing to do with it. Craig Ferguson's team, Greg Ferguson's team had nothing to do with it. Um, they didn't see it. They didn't approve it. Um, they requested that it be removed. It was. Um, now, even though this is an event that Greg Ferguson would be attending in his capacity as an MP, and not a speaker, so it should be perfectly okay for the party to be able to promote it in whatever partisan way they should, because in that case he would be working wearing his MP's hat, not his speaker's hat, because he is the speaker and because, well, conflict of interest, you must avoid even the semblance of any type of conflict or impropriety. If you want to keep things really close, you would be putting that type of genetic wording, anti-conservative wording on the messages for every single one of your MP's, except the speaker, which means that the person who's doing it has to have a listen, has to have a note that say, oh, when you get to the speaker, don't use that wording. And well, has to then remember to do it. So uh, clearly this was an oversight yet again. Uh, it's happening a lot, but it is an oversight. It's a natural human error. The conservatives are trying to milk this as proof that, uh, you know, it's like, this is a very partisan language and the speaker is supposed to be impartial. So they, uh, they sent Chris Workerton to be able to, to lead that. Uh, they, they both go, want him to resign. The Black Kebika wants him to resign. But, you know, again, I'm, based on my personal experiences with Yves-François Blanchet, I think it might have something other to do than the fact that it's a liberal. The reason why he wants some. Um, Greg Fergus to be gone. I don't know what that reason could be. It's just right on the tip of my fingers. Anyway, um, but yes, in December, you'll remember that Greg Fergus had to apologize for appearing in Speaker's Roads robes in a video, tribute video he recorded to interim Ontario Provincial Liberal leader John Fraser as he was stepping down from his interim position. Again, something that should not have created controversy because uh, he was wearing his speaker robes and he wasn't doing a video for in, for tribute to a federal liberal, but a provincial one. It was like two completely different levels of government. So again, it shouldn't have mattered, but the conservatives made a big stink about that as well. Uh, Peter Julian from the NDP uh, came in with a little sanity. Quote, the Liberal Party of Canada basically blindsided the Speaker, and in this case, that's why the National Director of the Liberal Party of Canada, I believe, needs to apologize fully and completely to the Speaker of the House of Commons. And the Liberal Party of Canada did indeed tweet a public apology 
uh, to Fergus for having designed and issued that tweet and published it without first checking it by his office, including partisan language to promote an event. For an MP, yes, an event that was supposed to be in this capacity as MP, so it shouldn't have been a big deal if we were all mature adults, but we're not all mature adults, and this is politics, and we jump on any potential slip. So that's what happened in this case. So it's pretty much a nothing burger. And it definitely doesn't have anything to do with Greg Fergus, so there's no reason whatsoever for which uh, Greg Fergus should be asked to resign for something that people in the Liberal Party of Canada headquarters offices had done. So there you go. So if you, again, if you want the man to resign for something he did not do, what could possibly be the reason? Again, just on the tip of my fingers. Whatever could it be? Anyway, uh, for the people listening at home who don't see uh, what we're doing, I, I'm actually uh, touching my face. It's because he's black. Shh. But I'm not one to gossip, so you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> oh, also, a little note in uh, Trump news. Uh, things are not going for well for him with his business as well. It seems that uh, Truth Social in uh, the first quarter of 2024 lost reported losses of $327.6 million against revenues of, wait for it, 770500 Not seven hundred and seventy million five hundred thousand, seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars and five hundred more. Not even one million dollars in revenue over the quarter, and that's uh, about a thirty percent decline from the previous quarter, Q four twenty twenty three, where they brought in one point one million dollars in revenue. So. Uh, He is big on ratings. He's got terrible ratings. With ratings like that, how could you possibly run for president? I know that we are not supposed to gloat at the misery of others. And I won't do that. I'll just beam. Ah, petty is my favorite color. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just cannot be sad for anything bad happening to him. I just cannot. I just cannot. And uh, with regard to that uh, video that came out uh, yesterday, well, uh, turns out, uh, irony, um, they're using uh, a similar excuse, actually, um, this is not a campaign video. It was created by a random account online and reposted by a staffer who clearly did not see the word while the president was in court. And the video has been taken down. Uh, Bo of the Fifth Column made an interesting comment, though. It's like, okay, it, let's say we buy this BS line. Right? That a video that mentions something about creation of a new Reich or something like that uh, was created by a random account online and reposted by a staffer. Um, does it not concern you that people are creating videos where they mention subliminally that you will ring back the first Reich? Because um, if the people that are making videos to promote you are putting in their videos that you will bring back or you will establish a first strike, then you must be giving off something that lets them believe that you're a little fash friendly, a little fash curious, right? I mean, yeah. Like, you may not think you're a fascist, but the people who vote for you do. I 
I, I would take a hint from that. But that's just me. <laughs> it's like, if you are the spot to where the fascist vote goes, might be a moment for some introspection. Just saying. Okay. Um. <laughs> Why? Uh, man, 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 man. All right. Uh, I do not think that I have too much more uh, to add here today, kids and cubs. So um, I'm not able to rejoin. Far too busy. Sorry, he says. All right. Uh, I will just send a message. I am ready to end now. <laughs> and then whenever Mr. Grizzly gets here, uh, he will. Um, I'm going to start the outro and hopefully everything will coordinate. And if it's not, uh, then I will stretch. All right, kids and cups. Um, so that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and world of mouth and world of mouth. Yeah, that's too. But word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Uh, no QR codes appearing under my chin today. But if you would like to support us and not miss an episode, you go to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words, sponsored by the Ray Girl. Oh, well, look at this. I think Mr. Grizzly is indeed listening in the background. What a great guy. I love this guy. Even when you think he's not there, he's there. I love it. All right. Yes. So uh, thanks to the Ray Girl. And if you click subscribe there, uh, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. If you would like a little more beaver than in your life, then please go to our True North Eager Beaver merch store on Etsy. That's etsy.com slash CA slash shop slash T-N-E-B merch store, all in one word. And there we have everything for you, keychains, uh, water bottles. Uh, we even have a round floor rug for you if you'd like to... Uh, uh, I guess, walk all over your beaver? Not sure why you would want to do that, but but hey, if you want to. <laughs> but we literally have a whole bunch of things for you, so if you need a little more beaver in your life, please scan that QR code, and it'll bring you there. We appreciate it very much. And if you would like to make sure that you support us in other ways, like help us get to a thousand, for example, on our YouTube page, then you need to make like Kit Lane, who says, have a beyond awesome day, everyone, and remember to smash the button before you leave. So you go to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. And there we have three buttons for you. Like, share, and subscribe. Click one, click two, click three. Have at it. Have a jolly good time clicking our buttons, baby. We love it when you do it. And help us get to a 1,000. Thank you so very much. Ah, Kid Cassie Lake. A, vac <laughs> a floor rug to lay on the beaver or as Meshadik says to vacuum the beaver. Do not vacuum your beaver. Just saying. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, miss, <laughs> says Kit Cassie. And if you would like to support us in yet another way, the True North e Beaver Emergency Hydration Fund, or our tip jar, can be found at our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash the, uh, sorry, let's try that again. ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. There you go. And if you scan the QR code that's up in the top left corner of the screen, that will bring you directly there. Thank you so much. The gift of your attention is the most important to us. But if you are able to contribute anything to the costs of the show or our internet, all of that kind of stuff, uh, travel for the podcasts, all that good stuff, uh, we would definitely, definitely appreciate it. Uh, every drop and tittle adds to the pot. So there you go. Oh, kids and cubs, you're getting so naughty and cheeky. I completely approve, but I can't read all of these on the show. <laughs> but thank you so much. I approve of your dirty minds. <laughs> okay. And uh, lots of praise for uh, Mr. Beaver there in the chat. You rock our socks, Paul, for him uh, being there uh, We we uh, to make care that we take care of the spot. Okay. Um, 
If you would like to reach us, we'd love to hear from you. So write to us on our Twitter feed at True Eager by email, True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com, our uh, Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, or uh, leave us a comment on our YouTube page. We try to read everything and we appreciate it uh, when you send us suggestions and you tell us what it is that you think. So uh, thank you very much. And remember, if you happen to have any beaverific news, just something good going on in your life, you know, somebody in your family graduated or you got a job, or or, uh, you know, you have an accomplishment, let us know about it because, you know, uh, there's a lot of doom in the scroll. So we can uh, we can reduce that. Uh, we we want to know if there's uh, good things happening to you. So if you have some beaverific news, please do, please do. And on that note, we'd like to offer congratulations to friend of the Beaver Lodge, Laura Babcock, and her wonderful husband who have been celebrating, who have uh, recently celebrated 25 years together. And uh, we love love here. All right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly also warns us in a programming note here that he has to be in the office for 7 a.m. tomorrow so he can start the show, but not sure how much he can contribute. So it might be another uh, solo show between uh, you and us, kids and cubs. So uh, we'll just uh, get a little casual and uh, get to know each other a little better. Right? (laughs) Because democracy is something that you do. If you voted and picked two West, congratulations. Take the day off. You've earned the rest. Uh, if you are in Alberta, please participate in the NDP leadership race in any way you can. And if you live in British Columbia, New Brunswick, or in Saskatchewan, there will be provincial elections coming up. Please look into see how you can help. Either help with a candidate, help with a party, or hey, maybe you would like to work at a polling station. We need you. All right. And hey, maybe not all the nominations are set in. Maybe it would be a good time to throw your hat in the ring and run for something. If not you, who? You might be the change that you're waiting for. Okay. And now, I guess I'm going to have to do the words of wisdom. I don't really have any. Kits and cups. (laughs) I really don't have any. Uh, But I will try my best. Um, Kits and cups. Uh, We are going through some times uh, where uh, a lot of people want your attention and a lot of people want you to place your trust in them. Please um, be discerning with whom you trust, with your vote, with whom you trust, with your confidence, with whom you trust as being sources of information. Um, there are very few people that are who are completely altruistic. Even Mr. Grizzly and I cannot claim to be completely altruistic. Yes, we want to make our country a better place, and we want people who are better informed. Uh, you know, but um, uh, we are capitalists or socio capitalists, <laughs> uh, just like everyone. We would like this to be uh, profitable for us, uh, but uh, we've made some ethical decisions along the way, uh, not at any cost. Right, not at any price, and uh, and respecting our audience uh, then becomes a factor. Uh, there are things we will not allow ourselves to do because it does not respect our audience. We do not want to disrespect your intelligence. Uh, we do not um, want to talk to you like you. we think you're stupid. Uh, we do not want to intentionally um, choose story matters and frames on stories for the sole purpose of getting someone. We try to make it clear when it is that uh, uh, we are speculating and when we are speaking fact, we try to put our biases up front uh, so that you know where we're coming from, so you know what to take and what to leave. These are all when we make an error, we correct it. Um, And we thank you for bringing the error to our attention rather than getting defensive. These are all behaviors that are consistent with showing people that if you are asking for their trust, which we are, we're asking you for your trust when you come to us, uh, that we are worthy of that trust. Uh, Because we intend to follow through on our side of the deal of the contract that we sign with you. 
when it comes to voting, when it comes to making choices in elections, a lot of people are trying to get your attention and a lot of people are trying to earn your trust. If they are lying to you, if they are twerking, if they are twisting, if they are treating you like you're stupid, if they are telling you things that are easily dispunked because they think that you are too dumb to know it and too lazy to go check or won't want to go check because the person that is wearing the same color team jersey as you are is saying it, you're going for cheap. You're going for too cheap. Your vote is worth a lot to these people. Play hard to get. Be coy. Ask questions. If something's not consistent, ask about it. If you see new behavior, ask about it. Don't just give your trust. And once you've given it, make sure that those to whom you have given it are not taking it for granted. And if they are, choose you, not them, not the team, not the, not the, not the ideology. Choose you. All right? Those are my words of wisdom. Kids and cups. So, from uh, the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager Beaver saying it could be a tough world out there. So, please, 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 please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Please be kind to and gentle with yourself, especially these days, right? Because there's a lot of stuff going on. All right. Hopefully, uh, Mr. Grizzly uh, hears me. Uh, if you do, uh, sir, just uh, send me a little note in the, the private chat. And uh, therefore, I will be able to say, cue the cock. And there we go. Until then, he says, cueing the cock. All right, Mr. Grizzly. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Ah, oh, thank you to the kids who had uh, some nice things to say about my words of wisdom. Thank you so much. Uh, just quick little Easter egg. Uh, three cheers for the Canadian women's 3x3 three three, uh, basketball team who at the last possible opportunity secured the last spot to go to the Olympics. So they are there. The men's 3x3 three three team unfortunately had a subpar performance and did not qualify. Uh, unfortunately, our men's eights rowing team also missed qualification for the Olympics by, I think, it's something like one one thousand of a second they finished third in a race that they had to finish top two uh, so they won't be going uh, unfortunately uh, swim canada has named the national swim and para swim teams uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have devin haru on the show soon to be able to talk about that so i don't want to go into it too much right now uh, damian warner uh, won the gold medal at the Gutsis Track and Field uh, Championship in the triathlon, uh, not the triathlon, the decathlon, for the eighth year in a row. So a uh, way to go, sir. That is absolutely fantastic. And uh, at the World Hockey Championships, uh, Team Canada has finished the round robin with a perfect 7-0. and zero. And uh, I believe uh, that uh, their first round playoff match, if I'm not mistaken, is against uh, Slovakia. So uh, there you go. That's all the news uh, we're caught up with. Thanks to the Canadians who make us proud. Oh, yes. French Open qualifications are on. Uh, Gabriel Diallo won this first round. So did uh, Rebecca Marino and Marina Stakusic, who was uh, the star for Team Canada when they won uh, the Billie Jean uh, 
King Cup. Uh, Carol Zhao and uh, Alexis Garneau were both eliminated in the first round. All right, that's everything. Have a wonderful day. Mr. Grizzly, please see us out if you're there. Now I might be sitting like this for a while. <laughs> Did not stick the dismount, kids. <laughs> <laughs> all right well hey you know what since we have more time uh let's talk about uh more canadians who make us proud uh at the world uh judo championships if uh we have uh in the women's 57 kilogram category if i remember correctly uh we have we're, we're spoiled with riches because we have two of the top three judokas in the world. Uh, I believe that it is uh, Jessica Klibkate is her name. And uh, yes, and Krista Deguchi. Uh, so Krista Deguchi is currently ranked world number one, and she won her fourth career medal at the IGF World Championships. She took silver in the men's in the women's 57 kilogram event. And, uh, and Jessica Klimkate took the bronze. Uh, so they finished second and third at the World Championships this year. Um, and they have to, the Canadian Olympic Committee has to determine which of the two is going to go to the Olympics. And uh, there's a whole point system and they get points and whatnot. And whoever's going to have the most uh, wins. Uh, but yes, it's a, and uh, for Jessica Klimkate, it's her third straight bronze medal at the Worlds, following her gold in 2021, which qualified her for Tokyo 2020, where she won a bronze medal. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're going to have to, It's I wouldn't want to have to make that decision. We have an embarrassment of riches there. Uh, and then there's uh, one other uh, judoka who had uh, yet to compete uh, there so well. Uh, and I, uh, I will get to the, hopefully we'll be able to bring you their results on another show. Uh, at Gutzis as well, uh, in addition to Damian Warner doing very well, uh, Celie McCabe won the women's 3,000 meter steeple, steeplechase race, uh, and she achieved the Olympic entry standard by more than 2.5 seconds there. So she will be the only woman to get, uh, so far she's the only woman to meet the standard in the, the 3,000 meter uh, steeplechase. Uh, but she will be going to the Olympics. Um, Cameron Rogers finished third in the women's hammer throw. Uh, Jean-Simon Degagné won the men's 3,000 steeplechase. Aaron Brown was third in the men's 100 meter in a season's best time of 10.23. And Lucia Stafford finally achieved the Olympic entry standard in the women's 1,500 meter race. Uh, there was another track meet in Morocco uh, for the Diamond League. Andre de Grasse finished second in the men's 100. His time of 10.19 was 0 0.08 back of winner Emilio SME of Cameroon. Sarah Mitten collected a third place finish in the women's shot put with a best throw of 1936, but she still owns the world leading mark for the year with 2030, 2068, and which she threw just last week, uh, the weekend before. Brandon Rodney, uh, who is also part of our 4x100 men's uh, sprint team, uh, he was at the Golden Grand Prix in Tokyo and he finished second in the men's 200 meters race there. So our track and field athletes are doing very well there. Uh, in beach volleyball, Melissa Humana Paradis and Brandy Wilkerson won the AVP Huntington Beach Open event, defeating Americans Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss, 23-21, 18-21, and 15-13 in the final. So that's big. And really, really big news in rugby. Uh, Canada women's rugby team defeated the New Zealand All Blacks for the first time ever, the legendary New Zealand All Blacks, earning a 22-19 comeback victory over the Rugby World Cup champions. The win moves Canada into second place in the women's world rankings, the highest they've been ranked since November 16, November 2016, and that's going into the Olympics. So uh, that is fantastic. Now, the Pacific Four Series is for rugby union, which is 15 players per side instead of rugby sevens. But the Canadian roster included several athletes who are regular competitors in rugby sevens and are aiming to be a part of the Olympic team this summer. Uh, among them are L Olivia Apps, Fancy Bermudez, Pamphinette Buisa, and Sophie de Gerd. So uh, great success there for our athletes as well. Uh, what else do we have? 
so we talked about the three-on-three basketball team. Uh, in diving, we've had three athletes qualify for Paris 2024 in individual diving events. Saley McKay won the 10-meter platform event to claim uh, Canada's Olympic uh, lone Olympic spot in that event. Uh, she had earned the quota spot with her bronze medal performance at the World Aquatics Championships uh, earlier and she had already earned an Olympic team nomination in the women's 10 synchro event with partner Kate Miller, who was the runner-up in the individual event at the trials. In the men's 10-meter platform, Nathan Zumbor murray was the winner of the trials, taken the second of Canada's two Olympic spots in the event. Ryan Weens had been pre-selected for nomination following his fifth-place finish at the World Aqu Aquatics Championships. Both men have also earned Olympic nominations in the 10-meter synchro event. And Canada's lone spot in the three-meter springboard will go to Margot Erlem, who won the trial by 15 points over Pamela Weir, Weir uh, who's a very, very decorated uh, Olympian and was hoping to go one more time. It came down to the very last dive, on which Erlem earned scores of 8.5 and 9 from judges to secure the top spot on the podium. She has represented Canada in several World Aquatics World Group and Grand Prix events, as well as the 2022 World Aquatics Championships and Commonwealth Games. There you go. And uh, for those who love volleyball, uh, World League Volleyball has started. Uh, it's a competition that happens every year between the 16 highest uh, ranked volleyball nations, men and women in the world. Team Canada is among both of them. Uh, the women's tournament started uh, last weekend and uh, all teams play round robin. So they go to different spots in the world over a couple of weekends and they're they are pooled in, in uh, teams of uh, in groups of four, and they play against each other there. Uh, and then uh, they go to the next place, and they do that four times. So after the first four matches, Team Canada is in fourth place in the standings, are women, with three wins and one loss, wins against Thailand, China, and the Dominican Republic, and a loss against Brazil, uh, which is uh, currently in second place. And for the men, uh, Canada, the tournament just started, and the men played Turkey yesterday, and uh, it was a very uh, exciting match uh, with Turkey taking the first set 25-17, but Canada winning the next three 25-23, 25-21, and 25-21. Uh, so that they only have uh, one uh, of the 15 matches they'll play played so far. So uh, Canada's in a four-way tie for fourth place. First place. <laughs> first place. <laughs> There you go. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, the extent of what I have now uh, in sports. Uh, so yes, uh, Mr. Grizzly, anytime you're ready to go, I was uh, stretching uh, because uh, uh, I didn't see you when I uh, finished uh, out the uh, my initial Easter egg. So if you're there, uh, please um, end the show. <laughs>